All right, good afternoon. I am, I am uh, Costa Constantinis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and today this committee is hearing three bills associated with climate. Intro 1399, which creates a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change. Intro 1055, which address, addresses the pervasive leaks in natural gas infrastructure. And intro 272, which requires testing for methane leaks in city buildings and after the end of residential tenancy. Intro 1399 would create an independent Department of Sustainability and Climate Change and repeal Section 20 of Chapter 1 of New York City Charter. In 2006, as part of Plan NYC, Mayor Bloomberg created the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability, now known as the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. In that time, MOS and its sister office, the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, has done critical work on raising awareness of the looming climate crisis and the actions that we as a civilization need to take to avert it. They have been amazing partners in creating a framework to get us to 80 by 50, helping to build the retrofit accelerator, and most recently, in passing the Climate Mobilization Act. The men and women of MOS and OOR have done an outstanding job, and I want to thank them for that. We cannot expect, however, that the several dozen employees in this office have the capacity to manage the sustainability policies for over the 300,000 strong city workforce. We want to give them more help. The retrofit accelerator is a good example of this. While I certainly don't mean to suggest that the work of the retrofit accelerator is not up to par, it's we have, you know, to say that we're going to do 5,000 buildings a year when we have a target of 50,000 buildings alone covered by 1253, not to say any other buildings in that, we need more resources. We need more help. Um, that's why there's no other reason that I can think of that a full-fledged agency would somehow be less equipped to handle interagency initiatives or somehow by doing this bill, we're creating silos that this Department of Sustainability would be the only ones thinking about sustainability issues. During the course of this own administration, we've seen the creation and expansion of Vision Zero throughout city government. Not only is part of you know, DOT who has the ultimate responsibility, but other city agencies as well are in, you know, implementing and working on Vision Zero. I look at this in a very similar vein where we create the Department of Sustainability, and yet still, sustainability issues could continue to permeate in every city agency, but there'd be one agency, one full-fledged department accountable and able to use the full resources of any other of their department to work, work on issues relating to climate change. Uh, and it it's also would create an additional level of oversight. You know, we've had city council hearings here relating to budget where I just, we don't have, the city council does not have the authority to ask about implementation of MOS. And that's also difficult for the public to ask tough questions about how we're spending the dollars that we need to spend. We're not going to spike the football on climate change anytime soon. If anything, we have to dedicate ourselves even further, we need to increase our, our, our both financial and intellectual capital that we're investing in fighting climate change because it's only going to get worse. As I've said before, our children, my son who is now 10, when he's the age I am now, our, all of our sons and daughters will be faced with a climate cal calamity that we don't, can't even fathom. It's time for us to make, as a city, a larger investment, a deeper investment, and one that when this mayor leaves, and when this city council leaves, that we're leaving behind a stronger apparatus, an apparatus that will be in perpetuity in relation to climate change. So I, I definitely want to make sure that as we think about all the issues that climate change touches, whether it's human health, welfare, infrastructure, resiliency, that a dedicated sustainability department would be the way to go, in my opinion. In addition, we're hearing intro 1055 today to create a map of methane leaks in the city of New York. 
Fugitive methane emissions from the leak-prone natural gas distribution infrastructure are the largest source of greenhouse gas methane emissions in urban environments. In terms of its warming potential, methane is at least 25 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. These emissions are wholly avoidable. According to the International Energy Agency, the industry could reduce methane emissions by 75% and two-thirds of those reductions would pay for themselves because the value of gas saved. According to a recent study published by the Journal of Science, 2.3% of total production annually is wasted through fugitive methane emissions. The lost methane is worth an estimated $2 billion a year. No one is cooking with these fugitive methane emissions. No one is heating or cleaning their, cooling their homes, but we are all seeing heating and cool heating of our own when it comes to climate change. Intro 1055 would require an office or agency designated by the mayor to examine, survey, and produce a map of all methane leaks in the city of New York. Where methane leaks are identified, this proposed local law would require notice to the gas company to repair or replace any aging, leak-prone, or leaking natural gas infrastructure located on or in any public way, or any leaking natural gas infrastructure that's a source of large volumetric leak is not repaired within 90 days after the notice, the designated agency must repair the leak and seek costly recovery on behalf of the city. Uh, I want to thank Councilmember Richards as well for his introduction, intro 12, uh, sorry, 272, and I'll give him the opportunity to speak on it uh, when he arrives. Uh, so at this time, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, testimony from all of the city agencies that are here today. So uh, I will now have Samara swear you all in. Thank you. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? All right, so I'm not sure who's beginning, but Mark, I guess you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Chambers. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I want to thank Chairperson Constantinides and the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration on introduction 1399 related to the creation of a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change and introductions 272 and 1055 related to methane leaks. Uh, as you know, this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to testify in front of this committee since the council passed the landmark Climate Mobilization Act. Uh, I really want to thank um, speaker, chair, and all of the staff for their dedication, uh, leadership, partnership with the administration uh, on creating a new and innovative legal regime to fight climate change, uh, from mandating new, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from mandating carbon emission reductions in existing buildings to requiring solar panels and green roofs on new buildings, to enabling the financing to get this necessary work done. What we did together was nothing short of setting a new national standard for fighting climate change and creating jobs. What we did together proves the Green New Deal can be done. In October 2012, the impacts of Hurricane Sandy brought home the reality that climate risks were much more urgent than many had thought. In the aftermath of the storm, aftermath of the storm, the administration not only focused on the immediate task of rebuilding and getting New Yorkers back in their homes, we also concentrated on putting the structures and systems in place to prepare the city and our residents for the new realities of climate change. In 2014, Mayor de Blasio created the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, which is now the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Out of what was previously known as the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability, or OLTPS, to ensure that the city had dedicated resources and expertise to both reduce our contribution to climate change by dramatically cutting carbon emissions and to strengthen our resiliency and reduce our vulnerability to the inevitable impacts of climate change. And in 2016, Mayor de Blasio created the Office of Climate Policy and Programs to lead the city's global partnerships, to take the fight straight to the fossil fuel industry, and to manage 1NYC, the city's Green New Deal. While with direct reporting to the first deputy mayor, 
These three offices are leading the administration's efforts to institutionalize our climate work across agencies and operations, and to fill the void of leadership left by the current federal administration. Our offices work with all city agencies and in close collaboration with all deputy mayors. This structure is delivering results for New Yorkers. Here are just a few of the highlights. We have committed to the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement and taken bold steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from every sector. We're on a path to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and 100% clean electricity by 2040. We're rapidly expanding renewable energy. Since the beginning of 2014, have installed so the installed solar capacity has increased sevenfold, and we now have enough solar installed across the city to meet the needs of nearly 50,000 households. We're also pursuing a deal to power 100% of city operations with clean electricity sources. We are implementing a $20 billion resiliency strategy to protect our city and residents from the impacts of climate change that include implementing complex coastal protection projects, mitigating extreme heat, hardening critical infrastructure, helping communities and small businesses prepare for climate change, and much more. We are holding accountable the companies that caused this climate crisis in the first place by suing five investor-owned fossil fuel companies most responsible for climate change. We're divesting $5 billion from city pensions and doubling our investments in climate change solutions to $4 billion. We just issued 1NYC 2050, the city's Green New Deal in April, setting forth additional bold actions to confront our climate crisis, achieve equity, and strengthen our democracy. All and all of our climate actions will create tens of thousands of good paying jobs for New Yorkers. We're also creating a culture of sustainability and resiliency in all agencies. While it's not our, off, our individual offices' roles to build schools and parks and roads, we are embedding climate smart thinking across city government. This means that when we plan and when we build, we're doing it with sustainability and resiliency considerations factored in from the very beginning. All of this work has been supported and augmented by our partnership with City Council, advocates, and stakeholders. At every step from policy, program, and project design to implementation and construction, we prioritize public input to ensure that each climate action we're taking not only meaningfully addresses the climate crisis, but also addresses inequity. This progress not only benefits New Yorkers, it also serves as a model to other cities around the nation and world. In 2015, New York City became the first city in the world to release a comprehensive resiliency strategy. And in 2017, we became the first city in the world to align our sustainability efforts with the Paris Climate Agreement and its goal to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Both of these steps, along with, with many of New York City's other resiliency and sustainability initiatives, were groundbreaking at the time. Now they have been emulated all over the world. Through networks such as C40 Climate Leadership Group, Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, 100 Resilient Cities, and ICLE Network, and others, we are working with other cities to scale up effective solutions. If there's anything like a silver lining to fighting climate change, it's that the administration and the city council are in lockstep when it comes to assessing the severity of the crisis for our city and the urgency with which we must act. That's precisely why the administration has vested responsibility with leading the city's climate action in mayoral offices. Climate change is a cross-cutting issue requiring the specialized expertise of almost every city agency. By giving MOS, MOR, and CPP the power to coordinate agency efforts, we are able to act with urgency, with the urgency our residents demand. Having said that, while the administration believes that our current climate teams are structured appropriately to meet the challenge, New York City residents need every tool at our disposal in this fight. We share your goals to put, that were put forward in intro to 1399 to prepare New York City for the impacts of climate change, build a more sustainable city, and effectively respond to and recover from climate emergencies. In the coming months, we look forward to discussing strategies for effectively meeting these goals together. I would now like to discuss two bills related to methane leaks being heard today. I want to emphasize at the outset that the administration strongly supports identifying and repairing methane leaks for environmental and safety reasons. We are pleased to have worked with the council in 2016 on passing a series of laws to better protect our residents from gas leaks. Introduction 272 requires the Department of Environmental Protection to inspect, identify, and report on all methane leaks in city buildings. 
Methane in and around buildings is most likely from natural gas that is used for heating or hot water production in the building. Natural gas is hazardous in buildings because it's flammable and because it could displace oxygen in a confined space. Natural gas utilities add an artificial scent to natural gas so that people can smell it indoors and, that there is, uh, and know that there is a health risk. In instances where a smell is detected, people should call the gas company or 911 immediately. As for work in city buildings, individual agencies are in charge of managing and maintaining their own buildings. And in centralized, a centralized process with one department in charge will not necessarily lead to the efficiencies or added safety. We understand that identifying and repairing natural gas leaks is critical for both safety and sustainability reasons, and we look forward to working with City Council on amendments that ensure the appropriate agencies are responsible for checking and preventing gas leaks. Although the Pur Public Service Commission governs how the utilities respond to methane leaks, we continue to push strongly at the state for, for stronger procedures for the utilities to detect and promptly repair methane leaks. For instance, through the Con Edison rate case currently underway, the administration has submitted public testimony to the PSC stating that the utility must take a more proactive and timely approach to repairing all types of methane leaks, not just the large volumetric leaks identified in Introduction 1055. And here in New York City, we are also actively supporting the utilities to improve their methane leak detection capabilities. Both gas utilities serving New York City are piloting approaches to integrate advanced leak detection technologies, as well as surveying and mapping leaks and making that information publicly available on their websites. I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to discuss our work and address the climate crisis. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to see you, Mark. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 I am glad to, you know, it, it decided to be, have you here after um, the Climate Mobilization Act passed. That was a big moment. Big deal. Um, thank you to the administration for your partnership on that. And I think we have a lot more to do. Absolutely. And I think that's where this comes from today, is how we work together um, to build on the Climate Mobilization Act and the work that we've done thus far. Because yep. uh, as you said, right now we're in lockstep. Yep. So the first question I'll s ask is, what happens when we're not in lockstep? Right, so there could be a time where we do not have a mayor um, that is, uh, believes in climate change, or maybe possibly a city council that does not. Um, how, uh, you know, by having a full department of sustainability, it would be out in the open, right? It wouldn't be part of a mayoralty, it wouldn't be something that could be uh, hidden away, right? So, you know, by, and it would be also the first jurisdiction in the country to create a Department of Sustainability, elevating climate change to the seriousness that we all know that it needs. So what would your thoughts be on how a full department would elevate um, the, the conversation around climate change? Noticing already we've done a lot of really great stuff, but we, we can't rest on our laurels. We have to continue to do more, right? I, I completely agree that you know, doing more is, is not only advantageous, it's absolutely necessary. Right. Um, the, to your original point about the, um, the benefits of um, making sure there is a legacy of this work and making sure that it has to continue, um, one of the hallmarks of our approach to um, our climate work is codifying it wherever possible. So it's not just working with, uh, with council, it's also with changing the energy codes, changing the building codes, changing the zoning codes to make sure that it, it is not subject to uh, just um, uh, prioritization, but it's become a culture of how we do work internally in, in the city as well as how the, the city at large has to uh, redefine our built environment. So I, I do think there are multiple ways f that we are doing now and need to continue to do to be able to, again, instill a culture that is not just part of how the city opera operates, but also how the, um, uh, how the city at large has to uh, work towards these initiatives. So how do you work with other agencies in relation to sustainable policy? What is the current um, mode of, of operation there to make sure that they're implementing it in every single project? Certainly. So there are three basic 
kind of prongs of, of how we're doing that. There's a staff level, of course. Uh, staff through all the mayoral offices that we described here work directly with agency staff on a, on a continual basis. There's also the direct engagement with commissioners. Um, consistently, uh, myself, um, other uh, directors of the other offices are constantly meeting with commissioners to make sure that there is a uh, a, a top-down culture that's happening within those agencies, and that's regular. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the unique aspects of how our climate policy offices work is that we also re meet regularly with all deputy mayors. So it's not simply, we do report to the first deputy mayor, but have consistent meetings with deputy mayor of operations, deputy mayor, uh, and so, so forth, to make sure that at all levels of engagement with agencies, we are creating the priorities or reflecting the mayor's priorities, but also making sure that there is no, uh, there's no room you know, to move away from that. So, uh, one second, let me just sit and recognize my colleagues. I was remiss uh, in recognizing, uh, we have Councilmember Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn who's here, and also Councilmembers uh, Eric Ulrich from Queens, and also Councilmember Donovan Richards, who's the lead sponsor on intro 272, also from Queens, and he's foregone his opening statement on his legislation. Uh, so thank you for that, but I know he has questions afterwards. So um, just recognizing all three of my colleagues that are here today. Um, so let's say if there's a particular, uh, for programs, for projects that are not funded by the mayor's office, right, for funding that is for city council projects, what are the programs to make sure that those projects have a sustainability component to it, that they don't get lost in the shuffle? Because sure. I have seen that a couple of times where, it's like, oh, if only we would have brought it up earlier in design process, and I feel like that's a missed opportunity. Like, how do we make sure that those oh man moments don't happen? Yeah. Understood. So, again, the, 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 the most consistent and salient way to make sure that projects have to have these embedded from the beginning is the changes we've made to, to the codes. Like, those, those impact projects from the beginning, absolutely. The secondary part of it, though, is that someone needs to be kind of tracking and pushing on these agencies. Um, one of the, the hallmarks of the 1.5 degree process after the mayor signed uh, Executive Order 26 was to also instill a, more accountability where there's a tracking of all of these projects and, and a tracking of their contribution to our overall climate reduction efforts. Those are done in-house and those are also uh, used as part of our reporting mechanisms back and forth with agencies to make sure that uh, they are being held accountable to prioritize the parts of their work that will absolutely c contribute to a reduction in emissions. All right, because again, I just want to make sure, I mean, part of the rationale for 1399 is having someone that we can hold accountable on a consistent basis, right? Is that to be able to, in, and I look at this, as I said before, in the same vein as uh, Vision Zero, where you'd have a department that is responsible but still having it permeate to all the other agencies and making sure that it's part of the culture that we're not siloing, which we can't do, but by having a larger budget. So I guess the next question I have is what is the current budget for the, for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability? Sure, and the, before I answer the budget question, just again, I, I do understand that um, there are, uh, we, share the out, we share the goals and we share right. the mm -hmm. need to be able to, Absolutely. to move, move quickly. As far as the, the budget's concerned, um, as far as the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in particular, the budget is about $17 million a year, um, and that is $14 million o OTPS and about $3 million for PS. And are there other agencies who have titles that are involved with MOS, or how does that work? Yes. So the, uh, all mayoral offices, and particularly the, one, the three we're discussing here, um, have staff that may be in City Hall, they may be in other agencies that all are part of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Um, uh, often, so for example, in the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, um, the majority of our staff is in, the, um, is in DEP. Uh, some of the staff is, uh, the staff lines are in D DCAS, um, EDC, or, or City Hall. The, oftentimes when there are new laws, where there's new uh, programs that are established, they often come with budgeted lines. And so when they sit in agencies, the lines often sit in those agencies as well, but they are all part of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I guess the question I have then is, new mayor, what happens if, you know, I know Vinny wouldn't do this, <laughs> but what happens, new mayor, new DP commissioner, they come in and take those lines back from the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. What happens to the Mayor's Office of Sustainability then? Well, like 
any new agency, the, the, the discretion over staffing does lie with the, the mayor, but the, uh, I would just kind of call attention that the same um, kind of legal framework that established in the charter that established OLTPS um, exists presently and there must be an Office of Sustainability as a right. result of that. Uh, but the if they pulled the titles, if, if one of the other agencies decided that they needed more work around wastewater or, you know, I'm, I'm using DEP as an example because, you know, Michael's sitting next to you. Um, I know Vinny wouldn't do this, but I'm just saying, uh, if the next mayor decides to pull those titles back to DEP for whatever reason, then what happened, I mean, there would still be a, a mayor's office of sustainability, but it wouldn't be as robust, right? That, that's what I'm trying to, to, to get at. <laughs> Yeah, and I, again, I would just say that the, the discretion still would stand with the mayor, whether it's agency or whether it's mayoral office. Okay. Now, when it comes to, you know, we're talking about three billion was the number that we talked about for the retrofits. Yeah, uh, for the needed retrofits across the yes, city? Yes, for the, for the retrofits billion. to comply with 1253, uh, what's the, I don't remember the... Four billion, I think it was the... Four number. billion now? Okay, so who is going to be running, uh, who's going to be ultimately accountable to make sure that the, the city reaches its goal of 40 by 25, 50 by 30. Who, who's, who has that ball? Understood. So and just kind of a correction there. I, I, when I mentioned the $4 billion, I thought you were referring to the citywide need to meet the, re the retrofit. Yeah. Um, the, uh, as far as the city's goals, the right. city buildings and the operational system under city buildings is primarily um, uh, directed by DCAS. Um, but addition to, similar to the other descriptions I, I made, uh, our office, the Office of Sustainability, has an integral role in that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as coordinating, assisting um, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, as well as other agencies to work with them and comply. And have we begun some of that work yet? Are we, I mean, I guess I can, I see Anthony looming over your right shoulder. I don't know if he wants to answer Absolutely. any of these questions. He's happy to, to join the party anytime he decides to. Uh, by the way, we're joined by Councilmember Rafael Espinal from Brooklyn as well. Just make sure you state your name for the record and she'll swear you in. Um, please, please raise your right hand. So we're affirmed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Uh, my name is Anthony Fiore, Deputy Commissioner for Energy Management with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Um, happy to answer questions. The, 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 um, the direct question about has the work started? Yes, the, the work has begun. We're in the process of um, actually implementing work as well as identifying a queue of work, um, not only for uh, this new fiscal year, fiscal year 20, but for outer fiscal years as well. And what's the criteria that we're using to identify buildings to retrofit? Or wh who are the good candidates? Like, how are we going through that process? And whose responsibility is that in city government? Is it DOB? Is it DCAS? Is it MOS? Like, who has that ball? Yeah. Uh, so DCAS, DCAS evaluates um, what efficiency measures and what clean energy projects to implement at the agencies um, in consultation with the agencies as well. So. We put out solicitations each year to all of the agencies on what projects they might want to submit, um, and then we evaluate those on a number of uh, factors that include both emissions and uh, financial factors. Um, and then we also, um, uh, the agencies also propose unsolicited projects to us, which we evaluate and determine whether they should be funded as well. And who, who has responsibility for resiliency? relating to city building. I know ORR, which I don't, I don't, it's not no longer part of my committee, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. <laughs> yeah. But yes, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency is who you're referring to. But they're also a mayoralty. Yes. They may have titles within different city, city agencies as well. Correct. Okay, how about biodiversity? Can I? Okay, Anthony, sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to add to that. Um, the mayor's office, whether it's mayor's office of sustainability or, or uh, resiliency, um, sets policy for city agencies. Um, so when we implement our work, it's, it's not just about energy reduction and emission mm -hmm. reductions, but it's also to take into consideration all of the city's policy objectives, including uh, cleaner air, uh, improved public health, resiliency, reliability of, of the energy systems, and. Um, the downstream attendant systems that rely upon energy and so forth. Um, so we, you know, we connect our projects to all of the city's uh, policy objectives. Right. 
So what happens when we, if we were not to hit certain goals? Like who, who gets held accountable? Because it sounds like there are a lot of different agencies that have the ball. And I know that when I was a kid, my parents used to tell me when everybody has the ball, nobody has the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so like who, who gets held accountable um, if we miss, if we are, or if we're ahead, right? And, you know, there's also this opportunity to get credit if we're ahead of schedule on particular uh, climate goals, which I'd rather be excited about that. But who gets held accountable? How do we, what's the level of accountability um, that we can apply to agencies, to MOS? You know, that's, that's, a, that's another question I would have. Sure. So I think that one of the benefits of the mayoral offices is that the mayor has the accountability. And I think being able to make sure that, to your kind of ball reference, that our kind of star player is the one that has <laughs> the, uh, the accountability. Um, that being said, there is still the ability to have more oversight, and, ha and we, are, we welcome that. I mean, when we met with the committee last April, it was for that reason, to be able to provide um, uh, a platform to be able to Mm -hmm. give additional information, additional um, responses to, to inquiries, and we're happy to do that again. Well, it's, but the problem with that is that that was a non-budget budget hearing, mm -hmm. right? It was a hearing that was outside the scope of the budget um, that we had to have that actually occurred after the budget response was written. So it actually doesn't give this body or the public an opportunity to kind of delve into the budget issues around MOS and ORR in a way that is, tra is transparent and then allows us to make solid recommendations in the structure of the budget process. I mean, that's a, a real challenge for this body and for, I mean, when you said this is the first time you're testifying for the CMA after the CMA passed, uh, that sort of made my point that, you know, we were unable to have you in front of us in the month of May in relation to budget. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult for us to get some of the questions answered that we had. Um, so I don't, I don't want to have to have a non-budget budget hearing every year in order to get where we want to go. <laughs> Understood. Um, so uh, you know, just really quickly, I don't want to take up all of the time here because I see my, my, I know my colleagues. Uh, actually, what I'll do, I'll, I'll give uh, Councilmember Richards uh, the opportunity to speak on his bill and ask some questions around his bill, and then I'll come back on methane leaks uh, as well. Thank you, Chair. A uh, few questions. So uh, let me start first off. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Um, <clears throat> so in your testimony, um, uh, you alluded to uh, amendments to the bill. Can you just speak to which agencies are you projecting should be a part of this bill? Appropriate agencies. I think you said in your testimony. I have to check again to see if what the reference exactly is. Um, but I'm assuming DOB. Correct. Just uh, appropriate agencies. Um, I don't think we've spelled out which exact ones we would So you support the bill or you don't support the bill? I think we support the effort of the bill and, and, okay. and the outcomes. Okay. Oh, awesome. All right, Mike Deloach, you got a green tie on. <laughs> All righty. Um, <laughs> How often does DEP survey city-owned buildings for methane leaks? So DEP currently isn't responsible for surveying city leaks. We have our own um, internal process to uh, check our, our own facilities. We have alarms and triggers that are um, related to our 96 pump stations and our 14 uh, wastewater resource recovery facilities, but currently we don't um, right. do and anything who, outside. Who of would be? Um, Check for methane. I think per PSC, there's requirements of the utilities to do a lot of that tracking. Um, and then we have a robust uh, sort of plan and process when there is a discovery of a leak that um, my partners at DOB or FDNY could allude to. So in city-owned buildings, there's no agency. We just leave it to utilities. The individual agencies are responsible for their own. Uh, so DOB? It's like a hot potato today. Let's just I'll keep let, passing it I'll down. Let speak <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, Robert Holland from DOB. So I think that uh, the department's position would be that there's not necessarily a distinction. You just speak a little. Uh, there's, there's not necessarily a distinction uh, between a, a gas leak in a city owned building or in another building. Um, the procedure would always be to first notify uh, emergency response 911. Um, and then subsequent to that, 
a, um, a repair, depending on where the leak is located, uh, would either be the responsibility of the serving utility or have to be conducted by a licensed master plumber in accordance with all the, the related code requirements for that. I, I would just add, Council Member, there's a lot, you know, there's educational tools, there's a lot that's been done to educate the public about reporting leaks. Mm -hmm. There's obviously an odor or a specific smell that's added to make sure that people are aware. So there's a lot of work that's been done to, you know, learn from best practices to make but sure. But I think we're talking about prevention. So the question is, in the city's portfolio today, who is responsible for um, overseeing methane leaks? And I don't want to put this on. Let's leave the utilities out for now. You mean identifying, identifying potential yes. leaks? Again, yes. each individual agency is responsible for their own. Okay. You know. All right, good. All right, so which one are you responsible for checking city-owned buildings? So again, the individual, there's no, there's no overseer of it. Each individual agency is responsible for their own facilities. So this, this bill is really good. Uh, I think we feel like this bill is a little bit redundant because a lot of the stuff that's happening. Would you is, say this bill is a very good bill? I would say it's very well intentioned. <laughs> okay. Um, fire department. How many reported uh, leaks did you have last year? How many calls did you fail? So there's two ways of def defining that. There's the calls and there's also the responses that have been identified as gas leaks. Um, we responded to almost 23,000. Uh, identified gas leaks over the the, uh, the last fiscal year. In the year before that, do you have numbers? I don't have that number, no. Are you seeing an increase? Uh, I'm not really sure if we've had an increase. We certainly see a, an increase when there is an incident with gas that uh, people s tend to uh, smell gas a lot more or smell something a lot more after an incident. Okay. And let me ask you, uh, I guess going back to DEP, so perhaps a, a leak or DOB, whichever one wants to answer this. Um, so if there's a leak, you would report to, you report it to the utility? Uh, you, you would call 911. 911, right. right. Yeah. Right. That but it triggers the process that okay. we have with FDNY. And how often, can you just go through the timeline of um, if there's a repair that needs to be made, how long does a repair take to be made on average? Uh, I, I, it depends, just number one, just from the top line, it definitely depends on the type of uh, leak and, you know, whose infrastructure and sort of what it involves, but I don't know. Maybe and how many leaks did we see last fiscal year? Do we track that number? The, the department doesn't necessarily track leaks, uh, specifically to my knowledge. Um, it's a great bill. But the um, utilities do map the leaks um, per PSC requirements. Um, do residential building owners report to the city on methane leak surveys or no? And are they required to report at any time? Sorry, say it again, Council Member. Do residential building owners report to the city on methane leak surveys? I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't so, know. Mark, uh, a local, lot of dancing going on today. Uh, local Law 152 uh, placed a requirement on building owners to have uh, their buildings inspected for the gas piping systems. Uh, those inspections are done on a five-year basis. Um, there's a certification made by the licensed master plumber, <clears throat> and that certification is will be submitted to the department. And that's self-certification? Is, is a certification, yes. Okay. Yes, and then so there would be, um, the department would have an audit procedure to ensure the accuracy. Um, I mean, I would have a lot more questions, but clearly we just need to get information first. I think the city needs to be aware of what's happening in its own portfolio at the very least. Um, and I just want to remind folks that, you know, there were people who lost their lives on 116th Street in Harlem, right? Eight people killed. We should really act much more aggressively when it comes to these leaks, not even just from an environmental standpoint but this is about people's lives and, you know, it's sort of disappointing that we have not taken steps even after uh, a disaster like that to really get serious about uh, correcting this issue. Um, you got my point. I'm not going to beat you up today about it, 
but we look forward to passing these bills. So um, we could have um, certainly a solution or at least information on where and how to ensure we're uh, decreasing methane leaks or ensuring they're not happening, period. So thank you, Chair. I rest my case. <laughs> Do any of my colleagues have questions? Okay. So I guess the questions I have in relating to uh, intro 1055, um, have the city ever examined the impact of fugitive natural gas emissions on the 80 by 50 plan? Yes, um, the fugitive emissions from methane, we believe account for slightly less than about a percent of the citywide GHG emissions, so about 0.7%. And are we working, because right now I know the utilities are doing a lot of this mapping, right? What are we doing to make sure that they're accurate? Like what, are, what is our sort of uh, checking, you know, sort of checking the homework to make sure that it's correct? They're not giving us a false sense of what's going on. So right now the utilities, as kind of you pointed out, are the ones responsible for, for um, uh, doing the mapping and making those publicly available. So I think mm -hmm. that the, the, point, the point you're trying to get at is the notion of having a, uh, an alternate uh, mapping entity that would be, uh, that could provide some verification. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, justification for that. Uh, and particularly, um, we do believe that there is a, there's probably a, a justification of a third party to be able to do that, um, that would be able to provide um, the level of redundancy I think you're, you're speaking to. I don't know about redundancy, it's making sure that they're accurate, well, right? <laughs> accountability, I think, is also. Yeah, account that's, that's, yeah. The, that's the word I would use, too. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes there's, you know, you walk into a forest and you might see the biggest tree there, and that's the, the utilities. I mean, and, but we also, there are other you know, sources of, of methane leaks that we are need to sort of take a look at, correct? Um, so that's, I know that Council Member Richards was speaking to that, and how do we sort of make sure that we're looking at not just the one big tree in the forest, but also the entire forest to make sure we're not missing something else. Absolutely, and I'll add um, uh, to both your points, I think that the, the need to be able to uh, advocate for increased technology around this is also critical. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the benefits of being in the middle of a rate case right now uh, with the utilities is that we are advocating and negotiating to be able to increase the amount of, um, of leak detection systems that are being um, um, again, deployed um, alongside um, kind of the AMI technology for, for meter reading so that the utilities are going to be forced to pilot these technologies that can provide um, additional um, alerts around uh, methane leaks that might be um, faster or more accurate than some of the other um, traditional techniques. Yeah, sure. And I, I went, I actually was in Taiwan. Um, actually, it was a government trip. <laughs> um, but we actually went to, I think it was like a smart, serve, a smart city event, and they actually had these detectors. And I was like, the US, New York City is so far behind where technology needs to be um, in these areas. But to see Taiwan, the Taiwanese government invest in this. Yeah, absolutely. And they're so far ahead. And the, uh, so Con Edison is, is deploying about 9,000 of these in Westchester, and, the, and that is a part of the, the beginning of deployment that will happen throughout the city. And, I, and again, I think using the rate case as the ability to kind of push for much larger uh, deployment is, is um, I think, will move us much further very, very quickly in this effort. So I guess, um, have we, has this, does the city have the authority or have we ever considered fining the utilities for methane emissions from leaks? I'd have to check on the authority. That's an interesting question. Okay, all right. I mean, this is something that, how do, wh what is our ability to hold them that, having that level of accountability if we do find that they are not repairing infrastructure in a way that makes sense for our city, what are we able to do? Are we able to hold them accountable? And I think this, by having someone that the mayor designates to sort of map these leaks, we can then decide on accountability, right? If we, I think that would be a good play, sort of first step to then the second step. I, I, think, I think there's possibility there. That, I mean, the, the notion is what, what do we have the authority over? That may or may not change based on the, the structure of city government. It may be related to um, the Public Service Commission and, and what's allowable, as well as interaction with the state. But I do think that, again, uh, there is a on-the-table present opportunity through the rate cases to be able to push very significantly to get the utilities to 
uh, begin to embed a lot of these into, into our work. Yeah, because I have some deep concerns about the rate case currently um, and some of the ways that the utilities are positing to spend money. Um, and I think we need to better hold them accountable and as a city, right? And, and I think we need to kind of raise that awareness in the public. Uh, and also as we're looking to decrease our uh, dependency on these same utilities, as we're looking to move to renewable New York City, it's like how do we ensure that they are keeping this infrastructure, uh, uh, how do they sort of wind it down as we get to a better place, right? And that we're not flipping the bill for it. <laughs> I, I would just add to, you know, I don't think it's in anybody's interest to have any of these leaks. And I know the utilities are doing a lot to continue to map and identify where they are mm -hmm. as aggressively as possible with, with, you know, the PSC as sort of their, um, their regulator, uh, in essence. Um, there have been a lot of changes or, or improvements that we've done um, as a result of um, some of the tragedies that we've had. We were in much better coordination with um, DOT, DEP, and the utilities meet monthly to compare notes on locations Please that have been problematic where there's either a cave-in or a depression. Um, DOT, when they issue a corrective um, action request at a cave-in, it used to only go to DEP, now they go to the utilities as well. So we're much more synchronized and making sure that we're quickly responding to um, reports of you know, cave-ins or, or um, depressions, which can sometimes be a signal for a leak. So there have been improvements that have been made to make sure that we're all you know, collaboratively doing our best to, to catch this. Right, but we were dependent upon them in a large way, correct? And relating on their data? Yeah, I mean, they're doing a lot of work to help. They're, they're doing a lot, sure. but they're, they're doing it in their interest, correct? Cause in it's, addition uh, <laughs> to the work that the agencies are doing right. on mm -hmm. our property as well, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, since I, I have our friends from the fire department here, I'll, I'll ask a question that relates to sustainability, and I hope that you can answer that question as well. But um, I know we have legislation before the council, and this will tie into MOS, I'm bringing everything together, um, but I know that to do a variance on for solar, uh, how is the work going to create an online portal to submit those variances? I know right now uh, there has to be a hard copy delivered to Metro Tech in order to do that, and I was told a couple of years back that we were moving towards an online portal, so have we gotten there yet? And again, this is just another opportunity for us to talk about how we, within interagency, have these conversations, right? Yeah, I wish I could answer that question, but that really uh, resides in fire prevention, uh, and I'm in the operations end, to re sort of response to emergencies, and the uh, fire prevention ha has that uh, aspect of we the- can circle back and get you that. I would love to do that, because I, I don't have a, the FDNY in front of me all that often, so I, I just want to take the opportunity where I had it here I wish I could answer all of your questions, and at home I do, but uh, I don't think <laughs> I can do that here. No, I, I just still find, I mean, I, as we sort of search for making things as easy to be green and just to be um, you know, regular, traditional, uh, this is just a huge thing that I hear from uh, the, you know, the public, right? Like, I want to get a variance on my roof. I want to be able to move forward. I have to spend a whole day going down the Metro Tech and submit, on, you know, hit, submit plans in person. I mean, it's the 21st century. I mean, I, I can pretty much do anything I want from this phone. I'd, I'd also like to be able to submit documents, right? And, and I think that just makes a whole lot of sense. Yes, I certainly understand that. And we've, uh, we've actually been working with DOB in trying to streamline that process. And, and DOB's here, right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a better Sorry position to, uh, to comment on the, the variances. We'll circle back and get you. Okay, great. And then just sort of the... Um, last thing I'll say is on, on budget, right? Because um, that, that's really, I'll sort of circle back to 1399. I, I got the extra stuff uh, here. But in relation to OBEEP, that's going to be under DOB. The office of, you know, the new, the, as 1253 we just built. Do we know how much budget, uh, how much money was put into this year's budget to build up OBEEP? to build out the retrofit, I mean, I'll just kind of all the questions together. Um, for OBEEP, for the retrofit accelerator, um, for all programs to relating to compliance with 1253, because I know building owners are either very concerned about what's going on or very excited to start moving forward. And what are we doing in this year's budget to provide them those opportunities? Absolutely. So the, the work to, to define and create the uh, OBEEP is, is underway now. Now that the bill is passed and it's become a law, 
The, mm -hmm. um, the work is beginning with the uh, DOB, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, uh, Deputy Mayors, to be able to develop and, and, uh, and budget for that. I will say towards the, the retrofit accelerator, um, in, in preparation for the Climate uh, Mobilization Act, the uh, retrofit accelerator was tripled in size. So it, um, the, we budgeted about $30 million that would be um, uh, accounted for over a period of three years to be able to allow the retrofit accelerator to begin to meet some of these, the massive needs that will be uh, undertaken with a city that's moving under retrofit. And now $30 million, how much is it in this year's budget? Uh, this year's budget, I want to say it's probably about $12 uh, million. About $12 million? I, I can come back to you with the right answer. And would that $12 million be re-upped for the next budget year? I mean, we got some saying, are we, are we building on these dollars every year? We're just saying 12 million this year, 12 million this year, and then 12 million the year after, and that's. So, so it was a, a three-year budget for this right. next iteration. So the next three years, we'll have somewhere in 10 to 12 uh, million dollars, and, um, and then we'll budget beyond that. Is that enough? I think for the, the, the work that we are undertaking and a part of, uh, there is always more to be done. And I think that we are actively um, moving the needle on being able to provide services, in, in this way, free technical services to, to New Yorkers. And I think that as p we begin to move on implementation of this bill, we'll be able to identify exactly where there are places that need additional budget and where there need additional resources to be able to meet those needs. Okay, I mean, so I'm, at this point, I mean, I could go all day, uh, <laughs> but I think I, my point's been made Right, that I, I just feel that uh, when we talk about uh, a mayoralty that is uh, dealing with the existential crisis of our time, dealing with something relating to the survival of, of this city in the way that we know it, um, I just really believe that we, a Department of Sustainability, makes the most sense in a way that will have more intellectual count, you know, capital, that would give you uh, more opportunities to have budgetary resources, intellectual capital resources, and not be dependent on other agencies' um, lines to be able to do this work, because it's so critical to what we do. And I think you're great, and I think that the, uh, the work that you're doing is great, and I can only imagine if we supercharged it, um, <laughs> what we could accomplish together. Um, so that's where I'm coming from today, uh, from a place of saying that we, we need to supercharge it, right? We have at least 11 years um, to get things done, and we can't wait. Um, so I'm gonna end there, because I could probably ask you a whole lot more questions, and you would answer me in the same way, and we just would go back and forth, and it sounds like a nice afternoon, but let's not do that. <laughs> so uh, I will you know, thank this panel for your time, and uh, I will um, uh, look forward to hearing from the next panel and working in conjunction to kind of get some of these sheriff's goals done. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. All right, the next panel. I should have brought my glasses today. Uh, Bob Ackley from Gaff Safety, Inc. Uh, Zayev uh, Magvi uh, from Heat. Nathan Phillips from Boston University. Lindsay Cooper from Mothers Out Front. All right, so Sergeant Arms is giving this out. I am going to put uh, 10 minutes on the clock for this PowerPoint presentation. Sure, uh, thanks a bunch. I actually have two PowerPoints. I'll try to go through the first one, which deals with the fugitive methane emissions, and I have another one, short one, on the indoor air. So okay. I can do them both at the same time and try to get through them. I'll see what the time is. 
But we're going to put you on a 10-minute clock. You put me on the 10-minute <laughs> clock, so I'll whip through them. All right, great. Fantastic. Hey, thanks a and bunch. After that, every, for regular testimony, we're going to do about five minutes apiece, okay? All right, great. Hey. All, All right. right, I appreciate that very much. Thanks for having me in. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Gas Safety Inc. Uh, from Massachusetts. Um, I'll go through it quick. My concerns mm -hmm. are safety, climate, health, and trees. Uh, that's what I've been working on for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, this is uh, in your 1055, which I just put in here. Um, traditional gas detecting equipment. I was in the gas business uh, for, uh, been in for 40 years. And we use flame ionization detectors, infrared technology, obtained methical detectors, combustible gas indicators, and the lowest but most important is soap to find leaks. Uh, I have a cavity ring down spectrometer that detects methane in parts per billion, uh, records CH4 levels every second, puts a GPS tag with it, and enables mapping of all readings like you've seen before maybe. Uh, this is the vehicle, one vehicle I use. Uh, let's see if the laser pointer works. Laser. Okay, uh, on the roof is a GPS. I guess it doesn't come in across on that, but we have a GPS flame ionization collector, and there's a little green collector in the front, which brings in the air sample. And then we have the traditional gas detecting equipment, flame ionization, combustible gas indicators, plunger bars, along with the Picaro cavity ring down spectrometer and allows us to do this, which I did in 2014 with uh, uh, Professor Phillips over here and Rob Jackson from Duke, where we mapped uh, about two thirds of uh, Manhattan. So here's some data uh, that comes from PIMSA that Con Ed reported on December 31st. They've got 822 miles of bare steel, and this is across their whole distribution area, you can't segregate it out uh, into New York without some more data. They've got 1,000 miles of cast iron, uh, which totals 4,371 miles, so 42 percent of the system is leak-prone pipe compared with 1.8 percent nationally. So then we go to the Con Ed service lines. They have almost 60,000 bare steel services out of 375,000, 376,000. So 16% of their services uh, are leak prone compared to 2.1% nationally. Uh, we did some work in Boston, uh, 785 miles of streets. And what we used, uh, that's 37% leak prone mains, which is, which is less than uh, uh, the Con Ed system. We used a special threshold on the analyzer, two and a half parts per million to determine a leak. Uh, in subsequent studies I've done, any, any deviation from background indicates a leak, so I think there were a lot more leaks. Uh, but what we ended up with was uh, around 3,400 leaks, or 4.3 leaks per mile. Then we went down to Washington, D.C., uh, same team, myself, Nathan Phillips, Rob Jackson. Uh, we went to Washington, D.C., which is very similar to Manhattan. Uh, 40 in Boston, 43% leak prone mains, two and a half parts per million threshold for leaks, uh, which came out to around 6,000 leaks at 3.93 leaks per mile. So then we did a system that was replaced. Cincinnati was a mess, I guess, back in the 70s and 80s. The system was pretty much junk. Duke Energy replaced the system, got rid of all the cast iron and spare steel leak prone pipe. It was pretty much all plastic. They only had. Uh, uh, I think they had, would we have 2% still leak prone mains in the system. We came up with 351 leaks in the system or just under half a leak per mile. Uh, Durham, North Carolina we did, that's where Duke is. Uh, we did about 600 miles of streets, it was mostly plastic as well. 0% uh, leak prone mains, so they had all coated steel and, and plastic mains, not considered leak prone and we still got 0.2 leaks per mile. So then we look at Con Ed leaks reported uh, two days ago on their live gas leak map. They have 4,371 miles across their system and 52% of it is still leak prone mains. So across their system they have 846 leaks or 0.19 leaks per mile. Uh, so we made this little chart 
Con Ed leads the nation. Boston, 37% leak prone, 4.3 leaks per mile. Washington, D.C., 3.93 leaks per mile. Cincinnati, which has been replaced with only, only uh, mo most of the system is plastic. We still got uh, half a leak, uh, say one leak every two miles. <laughs> Durham, North Carolina, uh, one leak every five miles. And New York City, with, in 2019, with greater than 50% leak prone pipe, we're equal to Durham at 0.19 leaks per mile. Uh, when we did the city in 2014, uh, it was 52% leak prone, so they've got rid of a little bit. We had 4.25 leaks per mile. That was the map you saw earlier. So uh, in our study, uh, we had to take out some of the data. We didn't do as much, we didn't include as much, but we had 247 miles. We had 1,000 leaks of 4.25 leaks per mile. So what they're showing now is, is uh, one leak every two miles, and we showed uh, almost nine leaks every two miles. So Con Ed has the highest percentage of leak-prone pipe in the studies. We've done highest study level leak rate at four leaks per mile, which actually equal with, with District of Columbia. And they have the industry reported lowest rate of 0.19 leaks per mile. Now, it's, it's hard to uh, compare these because there aren't many companies that have an active live gas leak map, so I give Cornet a lot of credit for that. Uh, also looked at National Grid. Uh, 2,669 leaks in New York City on 610. Huh? You got it. Thanks. Less than one leak per mile. Uh, I, it's hard to tell how many miles of Maine they have in New York City, but they're the old Brooklyn Union Gas Company in Staten Island. Uh, so this is Upper Broadway, uh, and I did this um, on June 4th, and I have this on Google Earth too, but I don't know if we'll have time to go through it, but the spikes that you see in yellow are from our study in 2014, and some of the same spots that I'm getting gas uh, in 2000. Uh, 19, I got in 2014. Same with down here on Manhattan Avenue. Uh, you can see the spikes around. I just did a, did a couple of, of uh, surveys uh, last week, a couple of little air selected areas, and uh, we had leaks there. So uh, some people would say, well, what else have you done? It's hard to do a comprehensive audit of any town, but I've done some, and I'm doing one right now. Western Massachusetts, which is a few miles west of Boston, about 100 miles of Maine. I'm, 98% complete as of today. They had about 130 leaks on the system we've uh, added. They had about 150 leaks on the system. We added 130, so almost doubled the leak count. Acton, Massachusetts, another town uh, just west of Boston, 95 miles of Maine. Uh, we doubled the leak count from 115 to 230. Now, both of these towns are national grid. Uh, another comprehensive study I did was with a small uh, utility in north central Massachusetts in the small city of Fitchburg, they had 40 uh, leaks, about 40 to 50 leaks on their records, and when I finished, we had 230 on about 100 miles of mains. So it's quite remarkable, uh, the results. We're always finding more leaks. But what I will say about the spectrometer is the spectrometer only detects the leaks. It doesn't pinpoint them. We pinpoint all the leaks with traditional gas company equipment that all the gas guys have in their vans. So there's no reason for them not to find these leaks. So why do these leaks matter? Of course, the building explosion is a no-brainer. Uh, when a gas gets inside a building, it can cause it to blow up. But what's often overlooked is the manhole explosions. And they're very complicit. Uh, if you look around New York, you have, uh, in the winter, you have hundreds, if not thousands, of manhole explosions. Uh, across the city where fires start and then draw in this what we call mechanical failure and corrosion gas that's sitting in, at lower levels. It's not like a hit main, but there's leaking gas uh, that's sitting in the ground that gets pulled in when the fire starts. Uh, and I have a couple of quick videos. What do I have, a minute eight left? So I'm not gonna get to them. Uh, you can look at these, there's links on here. The majority of manhole covers across New York City have been drilled with holes to allow leaking gas to escape. And it's referenced here in this New York Times article just recently, and it says, when the fire stack, the leak gas is drawn into the manhole by the fire and can reach explosive limit. We had 12 explosions in one manhole last month on Hammond Street in Brookline. So what, the, what is quoted in the article, to alleviate the threat, 
the official said, this, this was Mr. McHugh from Corn Ed said, the utility switched most of its manhole covers to vented ones that allow gases to escape so they cannot form a combustible amount. This is crazy because in another one of these articles that I have, I have two videos that you should watch. It actually says that with all the holes in the manholes, ice water comes in and, and, further, and salt to exacerbate the corrosion on these uh, lines. So also the climate, we've got super emitters. By eliminating the top 7% emitting leaks in any given distribution system, we can save 50% of the total emissions. Uh, health, we've got breathing as well. Trees, they matter too. <laughs> Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, here, so here's my, here's my question, right? So I'm going to read right from National Grid's testimony for the record that they've submitted today. So I'm going I'm to cut right to the end because there's a lot here. Um, but I'll read the final paragraph to you and I'd like your response. Sure. All right. So it says, in short, National Grid supports methane emission reduction efforts. However, assessing methane leaks should be left to the utilities, the owners responsible for the operating systems. Significant efforts to reduce methane emissions and detect and repair leaks are already in place by the utilities. Additional duplicative uh, inspection and mapping efforts may add significant costs to New York City citizens without apparent substantial benefits. We look forward to working with you to collaborate. Now that's, I paraphrased that last sentence, but what is your response there? Well, if you look at what I told you on the comprehensive audits, typically, we double or triple the leak counts in any given area. So I will say that there is uh, a lax environment at all utilities that I've been dealing with to actually demand their workers find the leaks because these are what they call mechanical failure and corrosion and they don't feel that they're a problem. And I'm gonna say that the manhole explosions, the black swan event where, where gas can accumulate and blow up, the greenhouse gas effect, all of those add up to a situation where the gas utilities are not actively uh, demanding their workers find these leaks. They're relying on the public to call in the, the uh, third party hits and the broken cast iron mains, which you have hundreds of them every year uh, that are very, very hazardous. And these other leaks, they tend to blow off. And those two videos that I put up there show uh, manhole explosions in quite a dramatic fashion where uh, we had one over on Park Slope which injured a fire department personnel. Uh, we had one that damaged cars. So uh, when these leaks get diminished by the utility industry, uh, take it at, at, at face value. There, there are way more leaks out there uh, than they're reporting in my opinion. Do you I've believe been doing that it for 40 years. Do you believe that they're sort of accounting this to sort of the cost of doing business? Right, like there's gonna be a certain amount of leakage, you know, we're gonna lose, we're gonna have 99% of our product, we're gonna lose this small amount, and you know, we're just gonna kind of, we're gonna look to sort of try to do something, but you know, it's the cost of doing business here. The customers pay for the leak gas in Massachusetts, and I assume it's the same here, so there's no incentive, and, and furthermore, repairing a leak comes out of the utility's bottom line maintenance budget in Massachusetts, there is no incentive for them to fix a leak unless it's going to cause an explosion. So I don't know what the case is here. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like they're being a little bit more proactive, Con Ed. I don't know about National Grid, but I call it, uh, I have an acronym that I call FANA, fix absolutely nothing anywhere unless it's going to blow up. It's amazing, uh, I could show you data from Weston and Acton, Massachusetts that shows leaks going for hundreds of feet thousands of square feet in migration area that they consider grade three non-hazardous and they have no intentions of repairing and we'll see about that. And you're aware of how old New York City's infrastructure is, we're talking about older infrastructure, correct? As you've alluded to. Well, I just did the research on the data of the last few days uh, and I looked at the annual reports. It's, you know, it, it, it's, not a, uh, it's not rocket science. You look at the report, it says they have 1,000 miles of cast iron, 800 miles of bare steel in a system that's got 4,600 miles. So uh, it, it's, it's leak prone and it should be monitored and the leak should be repaired. We should be repairing them uh, by size to reduce the greenhouse gas. Now did you, and so you did a lot of mapping relating, relating to Manhattan. Did, uh, should we extrapolate that the same things are happening in other boroughs as well or, I know you're very, sort of very focused on Manhattan and their study. 
we've, we've kind of focused on Manhattan and the studies. I wanted to get over into Brooklyn and Staten Island. I think they're actually worse. Come to Queens too. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be okay. We'd be okay with that. Queens. <laughs> I, I go, I've been in Queens too. No, the, like, the we're, point, we're, the point we're, is. No, we're a great borough. We're really big. <laughs> the, the point is Manhattan is very unique because of the, the continuous paving almost through the entire area where when you get into Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens, you have dirt areas that it, the gas can vent and they're actually more leaks to, because they, they're not considered as hazardous. I totally agree with you on that. With that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next panelist and I'll come back with more questions if I, if I can have any. Whoever, whoever. That we can put five minutes on the clock moving forward for every person who testifies, that'd be great. And it doesn't mean you have to go to five minutes. It just means you have five minutes. Hey. <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity Five, ten. There we go. to testify today. Uh, my name is Nathan Phillips. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Earth and Environment at Boston University. I'm a tree physiologist by training, and I learned about the gas leaks by complete serendipity walking a couple blocks from my house where I met Bob, who was measuring gas leaks that were killing a tree. So that's how I got involved in this research. And I want to summarize in a couple minutes just the research that we've done that has given us some ideas about the scope of urban gas leaks as a problem and leading to some policy solutions and directions. So Bob covered the first study of its kind, the 3,356 leaks that we mapped and found in Boston. So I'll just move on to after that study where we find thousands found thousands of leaks, the question that was being begged at that time was what does it all amount to in terms of lost money, lost gas, greenhouse impact? And there's two ways to go about addressing that. It's a difficult question. You can either go back to all of those thousands of leaks and measure how much is coming out. That's a laborious process. Or you can go up into the atmosphere and use the integrating power of the atmosphere itself and measure the buildup of all of these leaks into the urban atmosphere. And that's what we did in a study that we published in 2015, Catherine McCain and others. And from that study, we measured a little less than 3% of the gas that is delivered into Eastern Massachusetts is just leaked into the atmosphere, 2.7% to be exact. That may not sound like a lot, but because methane is a greenhouse gas on steroids, dozens of times more powerful on a comparable basis than CO2, that 2.7% leak rate amounted to 10% of the Commonwealth's entire greenhouse gas emissions inventory from all sectors. And it really wasn't on any ledger for municipal climate action plans and greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So that research established that the problem in urban areas is large. As Bob mentioned, we see that this is a problem across the eastern seaboard, including in New York City. So then we pivoted after that second study to a third study that was published in 2016 by PhD student Margaret Hendrick, where we wanted to go back to these leaks and say, are there some that should be prioritized more than others? And so what Margaret and, and Bob did was to look at 100 of the leaks of those 3,356 and ask the question, is there like an average leak size? Some are a little higher, some are a little lower, like a bell-shaped curve? Or are they distributed in a different manner? And we found that indeed, a handful of leaks account for a disproportionate amount of the lost gas. And so that was the result where 7% of the leaks account for 50% of the lost gas. And in my career, there's never been a scientific data result that was so clear in the policy implications. What it said was if you can find and fix those handful of large leaks, which we call super emitters, you have a cost-effective policy to address the problem. And that also unlocked another kind of solution that really resolved a conflict I had had about policy solutions, 
which was we can now triage this system. We don't have to rebuild this system that would last another 50, 60, 70 years. We can find and fix those biggest leaks and that affords us the opportunity to, to opportunistically look for areas in this leak prone network that we can start to move to electrification, a cleaner, safer, healthier, and ultimately more cost-effective way to deliver thermal energy. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Does that work? Yes. Um, my name is Zainab Magavi, and I'm uh, from HEAT, a director at HEAT, and I um, worked on the large volume leak study with um, Professor Phillips, and I want to first thank you for being the kind of leaders we need right now. Um, you're <laughs> really, w as we face the rapid change and challenges of the next decade, um, I really admire uh, these proposed bills. I think they're practical uh, and cost-effective steps to reduce the harm from our gas system. And I want to point out that um, until very recently, a lot of us believed that the gas system was clean, green, and a bridge to the future. Um, but uh, that is no longer true, and science has really um, reestablished that. I'm going to um, in order to ensure, ensure that I talk about the bills, I will come back to that part, but uh, we propose in Massachusetts an approach of triage and transition, accepting that gas is the past uh, and that we need to move forward. Um, we want to first ensure that the safety of the existing gas system is taken care of and that we move quickly to cut the most emissions for the least cost. That's the part I call triage. It's stem the bleeding, keep the patient safe. And number 1055 does just this for the pipes in the streets of New York. It essentially creates enhanced oversight and the authority to act swiftly to reduce emissions from gas leaks. And I think this is common sense. And as you saw in the testimony from Gas Safety Inc., it seems to be needed. Uh, it also uses the leak extent measure that uh, Dr. Phillips referred to as a rapid low cost proxy measure to find the largest leaks. I think this is a fantastic policy opportunity, and the research that supported this policy was a joint effort in Massachusetts, a very unusual joint effort, between us uh, scientists, environmentalists, and National Grid, Columbia Gas, and Eversource Gas. And we jointly submitted the plan, and it is currently regulation in Massachusetts, and we are on our way to cutting our gas leak emissions in half in Massachusetts, estimated at four to five percent of our state's greenhouse gas footprint in just three years. But gas pipes uh, don't just leak in our streets, they leak inside our buildings too. And a very recent California study showed last year that 70% of homes with gas service tested had an elevated methane measure. It's an enormously high percentage. Uh, and Gas Safety Inc. has also gotten similar results in current testing in mass, not yet published. Uh, an environmental science and technology publication this year showed really shockingly, unexpectedly high methane emissions off of gas appliances, which extrapolated added up to 10% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So your Bill 272 triages this leaking gas system inside our buildings, and uh, that is not the emerging story of gas leakage in buildings is not just about the safety and the emissions that we're concerned about in our streets, but it's also about health. And uh, methane gas is not toxic, uh, but natural gas is 95% methane and the remaining 5% includes such chemicals as benzene, which is, for example, a carcinogen. Um, you can see the low levels that are reported by industry pipeline quality data. Uh, so this means that uh, leaks building up in a home, even if they're not enough to explode, could potentially have long-term health impacts. And, you know, whose health? Well, always the most burdened are always hardest hit. We already know that gas stoves produce NO2, which is strongly associated with asthma, and we know that asthma rates continue to rise, especially in low-wealth communities. Um, so, so, again, gas leaks, and all the leaks, indoor and out, are not safe for us or for our climate. I hope you will act swiftly with these bills to triage the system we have and transition to renewable thermal. Um, I hope that 
it, 1399's new Office of Sustainability can help us move just as swiftly to transition to renewable thermal. We have the solutions we need now. And investing our ratepayer dollars wisely in infrastructure for this century, not digging into infrastructure from last century, um, would be a great way to build the future we want. Um, and uh, for me, personally, that safer, cleaner, greener, healthier future is what I want for my children and for all our children. Uh, so it's in our hands to protect the New York of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. So my name is Lindsay Cooper. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, make sure you push the red button. Can you hear me now? Any better? Uh, hold on. Sergeant Arms are coming over. We're good? Okay. Okay, so my name is Lindsay Cooper. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I represent Mothers Out Front, an organization that empowers mothers, grandmothers, um, caregivers to take action within their communities against um, climate issues. Um, will everyone from Mothers Out Front please stand? And we do have a few other members outside who weren't able to come in because we're at capacity. Um, so I'd like to invite you to imagine yourself in the shoes of Michelle, a mother of two, Chris and Sean. Uh, both children are energetic and talented, and they run track, but not without difficulty because they both suffer from asthma due to poor air quality um, in their low-income community. Michelle worries constantly that her children su will suffer from a severe asthma attack. And this past spring, Chris, in the middle of a track meet, was rushed to the hospital. Michelle left work early to meet him, causing her to lose wages and take on an expensive, medical, uh, expensive hospital bills and prescriptions. Michelle and her husband, John, each work multiple jobs to support their family, but still they struggle to make ends meet. And they live in a constant state of fear for their children's lives while feeling like the problem itself is in the very air that they breathe. An energy system based on gas is not clean, safe, or efficient, and there are leaks, leaks at every single stage of the system, from the fracking fields to compressor stations to transmission pipelines, and then to our homes, places of work, schools, and grocery stores. Methane leaks put communities at risk both indoors and outdoors, and leaks can happen in any building in any community. They can even lead to lethal explosions like ones we've seen here in New York and in Merrimack Valley in Massachusetts. Um, in New York, a city that's so dense, it's especially um, vulnerable to devastating losses of life, property, and culture. So these leaks also accelerate climate change at an alarming degree as methane is 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the first 20 years in the atmosphere. Knowing where these leaks are and repairing the underlying infrastructure is an environmental justice issue. And Michelle's story is not unique. There are countless mothers across New York who share similar stories. And we at Mothers Out Front want to amplify these voices. So the oil and gas industry has caused enough devastation in the US and disproportionately so in African American and low income communities. Environmental hazards are most often placed in African American communities and the impacts can have lethal consequences. Too many people are denied access to livable wages, health care, child care, and other vital resources. And some communities have the resources to recover from events like explosions, but um, in communities like Michelle's, which are already suffering from toxic environmental issues on top of different socioeconomic issues, um, they're the most vulnerable. Michelle and her family have no control over environmental issues that impact their family's health, but um, the city council does, so I urge you to support these bills to protect low-income families by using appropriate sensitive equipment to find methane leaks and by fixing the crack-prone pipes. And I also thank you um, and hope that you will continue doing your part in making a just transition to clean and renewable energy that will ensure the safety of all communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so I definitely um, share this panel's concern um, in relation to methane leaks and to the need for us to transition away from gas infrastructure. I know how you know, we fought the you know, Williams Pipeline and were able to achieve a, a victory that we had to ensure remains a victory um, moving forward, but you know, and the, in the gas infrastructure that we do have uh, we need to make sure that there aren't leaks and uh, that we, someone is watching the utilities. I think that's the big takeaway that I have today is that the reporting that they're doing on the leaks 
have some holes in it. <laughs> and that we could probably do a whole lot better. I, th I think you, you wanted to add something there. Well, I did want to show you something. How could, I, could I take one minute? One minute, you've got okay, it. Okay, one minute I got. Uh, on the indoor air, I've been working on this since 2006, uh, doing testing uh, for National Grid originally down in Rhode Island, found leaks in every house. I have some data on that, but I developed a test that we can do, and the first building that we're gonna do in New York is the City Hall Chamber right here. I can take my Tedlar bag and fill it with air from right in this building, and then run it through my analyzer and tell exactly how much methane is in City Hall. So we can do this with every building in New York. I would do every floor and the basement and get the readings throughout each building. You can determine if there's any gas leak. I would definitely be interested in hearing when you, <laughs> as you walk through City Hall. I can show you the strata of data if you're interested, but uh, they go from naturally occurring methane is around two parts per million. Mm -hmm. So if there were no leaking gas in this building, I would get two parts per million in this bag. The highest reading I've got so far is 38 parts per million inside a dwelling unit. Okay. So that is uh, 19 times background. So what happens with people with leaking gas in their homes, they get inculcated to the smell and they can't smell it anymore. And somebody else comes in and says, geez, I smell gas in your house. And they say, well, I've had the gas company here. We, they didn't find anything. Most of their instruments start at 500 parts per million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most of their instruments detect 500 parts per million as the low range. My instrument detects in parts per billion and will give the exact methane read in the chambers in any room, any locus in the country. And you can mail it to me. Right. Thanks a lot for that, I appreciate it. Thank you, I thank this panel for all of your advocacy and, and your work, thank you. I'm gonna call the next panel up. Uh, so, uh, Rowan Lewis from the Waterfront Alliance, uh, Bob Wyman, who's representing himself, uh, Cecil uh, Robar, uh, I, I, Cecil, I know you well, but uh, mother's out front. I'm having trouble seeing this. I should have brought my glasses today. Uh, Aisha uh, Brandage Move uh, from uh, New York Lawyers for Public Interest. Uh, I can see the better. Dominic. Dominic. Again, I should have brought my glasses today. Dominic Nicholas uh, from Meet, and fr uh, Lisa DiCaprio from Sierra Club. So I guess we'll start here on my left. You, yeah, so you're right. Honorable council members, I uh, very much appreciate this opportunity to speak today. Uh, I joined HEAT a few years, a uh, year ago and plunged into the world of uh, gas leaks. I'm fairly new to this uh, area. Uh, today I run the large volume leaks program at HEAT and uh, doing gas research at Boston University. And I wanted to share some of the things I've learned so far. Um, to build off of Zainab's story earlier, uh, that gas has been sold to us as uh, green, clean, and cheap, and a bridge fuel. Uh, I've learned that actually um, none of those things are true. Uh, it's not green and clean, as uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, gas is mostly methane, uh, which is 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide for the first 20 years in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, Massachusetts gas system is very old and leak prone, as you've heard today. And each year there are approximately 40,000 leaks with 16,000 leaks unrepaired at the end of the year. And about 3% of all of the gas coming into Massachusetts is leaking, and that gives gas the climate impact equivalent to coal, which was uh, kind of eye-opening for me. Um, all parts of the gas system is uh, are leaking, extraction, pipeline, compressor stations, uh, gas mains, and as we're hearing, supplies into our homes as well. 
Um, we're starting to find uh, more out about the, the health risks of that inside our homes. Uh, it's not cheap. Uh, leaking infrastructure can either be replaced or repaired, uh, and both are costly. Uh, replacing pipelines in Massachusetts uh, over the next uh, 40 years is estimated to cost $9 billion. As we move away from gas to reach our emissions goals by 2050, this new pipe will become stranded assets. Uh, if we decide to repair leaks, recent analysis has shown that uh, on average, leaks are costing about $4,000 to fix per leak, and obviously we estimate there will be a lot more in New York. Uh, multiply that by the 40,000 leaks a year, and, and you've got quite a lot of money uh, adding up there. And all of that's paid by uh, ratepayers. Also, the cost of human health impacts, uh, disaster recovery from explosions, and climate change impacts makes gas uh, not a cheap uh, fuel. Uh, also, it's not a bridge fuel. Uh, gas is a fossil fuel. Uh, we don't need a bridge. In fact, I believe we can go directly to renewables today and uh, you know, we, d we can decide, do we invest in this so-called bridge or in safe, clean, renewable energy infrastructure that we want for our future generations that doesn't damage the climate? So for these reasons, uh, I believe that we need to move beyond gas and, and do mm -hmm. it urgently. Um, I strongly support this bill, the 1055. Uh, what I've learned, uh, as I said earlier, I'm fairly new to this, but as what I've learned in Massachusetts is that uh, the legislation can perpetuate a positive cycle of emissions reductions, and without the legislation, uh, this impact might not be possible. So, for example, in Massachusetts, the pattern I've seen is research and community uh, leading to new gas leak legislation, and that legislation, for example, has required gas leaks to be fixed and to provide leak data transparency. Uh, that data has in turn led to more research and more community action, and overall just reducing uh, methane leak emissions. So I strongly uh, and urgently support 1055. I think a central office uh, function focused on surveying and mapping all gas leaks can provide critical and independent and transparent oversight of gas utilities, putting the public and the environment first. Um, I think fixing leaks is urgent. Uh, let's fix it in months and not years. And legislation that we've seen in, in uh, Massachusetts recently has um, you know, it's, it said we can fix these different grades over years, but I think that's too, too long, honestly, and, and uh, I like 1055 proposing it in a much shorter time frame of three months. Um, it's common sense if you've got the road open, for example, uh, to get in there and actually repair the leaks. Uh, it's more cost effective, and it's just common sense, to, I, I think. Uh, right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, to you. I'm also here on behalf of Mothers Out Front, uh, so a shout out to my team members in the back. Um, so my husband and I live on the Upper West Side with our son Sebastian, who just graduated high school. Our other sons, Calvin and Jasper, are now living on their own. One is in college, and the other one is a farmer and about to become a parent himself. Um, my name is Cecil, and I'm here as a concerned mother, soon to be grandmother. and. Um, a fellow New Yorker. So last year I had the opportunity through Mothers Out Front to go on a gas leak safari with Bob, whom you heard from on the last panel. Um, as someone who's both passionate about science and the environment, it seemed like an incredibly interesting and fun way to spend my day. Um, and it was, uh, but what I did not anticipate was how disturbed I was at the end of it. Uh, Bob picked us up, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bit of a sore throat today. Uh, Bob picked us up in his van, which was tricked out with gadgets for measuring gas leaks you saw on his uh, slides before. Um, he explained how everything worked, and then we set out from Riverside Drive at 80th Street. We drove uptown and got out on Manhattan Avenue, where his equipment was showing a significant leak. 
This is where I learned that those little blue caps that you see all over the pavement here are actually places that were, um, where previous leaks have been fixed. I don't know if any of you have noticed these, but there's a lot of them everywhere. Um, Bob and I measured the leak, and since it was not on their map, he reported it to Con Ed. I was really surprised at how little smell there was um, in, consider in relation to how much gas was actually coming out. We ended a trip with a drive up along West End Avenue where we passed by my building. West End Avenue seemed to have the worst leaks, which really opened my eyes and showed me just how much my neighborhood and family are susceptible to the these hazards of gas leaks. None of these leaks were on the Con Ed map either. This is where my family and I walk around every day. It's an area of the city that's always very clean, very well kept. It has beautiful flower beds, it has trees. Um, considering most of the buildings are pre-war, it makes sense that there's issues with aging infrastructure, but I just assumed that since everything was so well kept, uh, there would be no issue with leaks. Um, my son Sebastian has asthma, and as a mother, this adds another layer of concern about the quality of air that we all breathe. In a few cases, the leak seemed so bad, I actually wondered if it was safe to walk around there. And this past November, there was a big explosion on 91st and Broadway, which is two blocks from my house. Um, and I I'm sadly was not really surprised after having been on the safari with Bob and seeing how big of an issue this is. Uh, now I passed, I walk past those blue caps where that explosion was every morning on my way to the train. And I can't help but wonder when there's going to be another explosion and if someone's going to get really hurt this time. Uh, we've been releasing toxic things into our oceans and airs, um, thinking that whatever it is will just dissolve beca because we can't see it. But I actually think we all know that that's not the case. Um, if you need a visual, just uh, keep an eye out for those blue caps. Um, to end, I want to say I was very, very excited to be here last April to watch you all pass the Climate Mobilization Act. Um, and I'm really thankful today that you're acknowledging the need that we need to go even further and push, put measures in place to eliminate the gas leaks as part of our climate solutions. I urge, urge all council members to pass Council Member Constantinides Intro 1055 that relates to the examination, surveying, and mapping of all the methane gas leaks in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Constantinides and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Asha Brendage Moore, and I'm a student at NYU Law and a summer intern at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I'm here today to speak in support of Introduction 1399, New York City and the members of the council members here in particular is a leader in addressing climate change. To continue this progress, the city must not only continue to pass groundbreaking legislation, but also ensure there's accountability, enforcement, and follow through by the city. As we all know, creating a greener, more sustainable city in the face of climate change is a complex, multidimensional problem that demands a coordinated response. At New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, we have worked for three decades to advocate for low-income communities and communities in, of color in New York City that face disproportionate environmental hazards. The impact of climate change and unsustainable practices like fossil fuel dependence and poor solid waste management fall hardest on communities we partner with. We support Introduction 1399 because it would enable our big city to better address the complex problem of climate change and sustainability by coordinating the city's sustainability strategies, increasing oversight, and bringing city organization in line with peer cities. 2019 has been a busy year in the fight against climate change. With legislation on reducing building emissions, green roofs, and bag fees all passing in the first six months of the year. The implementation of these laws will be overseen by several different city departments. Many different sectors, like buildings, vehicles, and power plants, contribute to climate change, and the consequences of climate change, like rising sea levels, impact many parts of the city's infrastructure. Introduction 1399 
would help coordinate sustainability initiatives across sectors so that New York City residents could have a central clearinghouse for information about energy efficiency, local composting, and installing rooftop solar. This would help the new department achieve its goals of educating the public on climate change and sustainability initiatives. A single Department of Sustainability and Climate Change would also help facilitate effective communication between other relevant agencies. Introduction 1399's advances advances the city's climate change goals by ensuring continuity and oversight of the city's sustainability efforts. Transitioning to a more sustainable city is an important long-term goal and moving oversight of sustainability and climate change policy out of the mayor's office reduces fluctuations that can come from a changing administration. It also allows for real oversight from city council who can call hearings and request testimonies from the new commissioner to ensure the department is doing everything necessary to achieve its goals. Injection 1399 is a sensible way to move forward addressing not just, the climate, not just issues of climate change, but also resiliency and civic engagement. We look forward to continue, continuing to work with the City Council to advance this issue. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Welcome to the People's House. Glad to have you here testifying today. Thank you. Um, how are you, sir? Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Bob Wyman, and I would like to speak in support of uh, uh, 1055 as well as 1399. Um, first, uh, on the subject of 1055 relating to uh, leaks. Uh, I'd like to say up front, I'm a little prejudiced on this subject. Uh, I've got a personal interest. My daughter lost a, uh, a high school friend um, when the building blew up down uh, down in the village uh, a couple years back, and so we've seen uh, we've seen death in in my family, or at least close to it, as a result of these leaks. Um, but given that I don't have a lot of time, I want to focus on just one aspect um, of 1055, and that is the the word replace. Uh, many people have said that we should, in fact, identify, fix, and replace these leaks. I want to uh, suggest to you that there is an alternative, which was first proposed by Central Hudson Gas and Electric for their district, and that is that when uh, replacing uh, leaky pipes is particularly expensive, the alternative is, in fact, to abandon the pipe, to shut it off, abandon the pipe, and replace it with, in their case, geothermal heat pumps. And to give you some, ex uh, some sense of why this might make sense, we can look at Con Ed's uh, responses to discovery requests in their uh, current rate case. And they say that in 2018, they replaced, replaced 1,484 leaky services um, in their territory. Services are the pipes that connect from the gas main to the buildings. That cost, on average, of replacing those services, just those pipes uh, between the main and the house, was $26,675. Repeat, $26,675 to replace the pipe, a leaky pipe between the house and the, and the main, and that was done 1,484 times in 2018. As you probably recognize, 26,000 or 27,000 here is uh, uh, pretty much the cost of, say, a new geothermal heat pump system, which would permanently prevent leaks in the future. I would suggest that you modify the language to indicate that as far as the word replace is concerned, that replace should include not only replacing pipe, but also replacing the thermal system, the heating system, the service which is being provided. Um, uh, as Central Hudson has proposed be done in their district, let's have uh, New York City follow suit and uh, begin the process of abandoning um, the leaky uh, pipes that we have, rather than simply patching them up and trying to move them into the next decade. The other thing I'd like to do is talk about uh, 1399. First of all, I'd like to say it, it would be, it, we've seen from the minimal amount of service we got from the Office of Sustainability that having such a thing is useful. There were a lot of problems with that office, one of the big ones being that they were undermanned and under-resourced. I think, as you, you all know, uh, they were uh, horrendously late on things like the geothermal potential uh, study, which I think was on the order of, what, a, one, and a half, one and a half, two years late. Um, they have not been a major presence uh, within the city. What they have done, they've done well, but they haven't done enough of it. 
it would be excellent, given the importance of this issue to, uh, to our future, if in fact uh, we had a real department that was funded appropriately. The other thing I'd like to do is suggest that as we move forward, we should think about sustainability as being uh, in, in a broader sense than we do today. Sustainability should not just be a question of environmental sustainability, but it also should be one of financial st stability. And uh, along those lines, I'd like to call to your attention Con Ed's current rate case, in which they have proposed, in order to make it easier to get through their rate case and to what they call mitigate rate increases, they have proposed to use um, uh, accounting techniques to ignore over $2 billion, $2 billion of deficiencies in their depreciation accounts. What they're doing is they're proposing that we ignore a depreciation study that was done for them by an independent third party operation, and in fact to continue using depreciation uh, uh, attributes uh, from earlier rate cases, which they themselves in their testimony say are incorrect and that should and will in fact cause us financial sustainability issues in the future. The fundamental problem here is that we have to recognize is that natural gas is already not a bridge fuel. We've gone well beyond that point. We know that today, according to the New York City inventory of, of greenhouse gas emissions, that natural gas already today accounts for 144% of the total citywide all sources budget for carbon emissions in, 2000, in 2050. So today, natural gas alone, which has been increasing, is 144% of all of the carbon emissions that we would allow in this city in 2050. We need now to begin the process of reducing our investment in natural gas and we need to do it in such a way that we um, are not, not only enhancing our environmental uh, uh, priorities, but also doing it in a financially responsible way. And primarily what that means is not allowing the company to bury its uh, depreciation deficiencies, but rather for us to face them directly and for us to accelerate the process of depreciation and to begin now the process of managed decapitalization that is necessary in order uh, for us to get rid of this uh, uh, environmentally dangerous. Bob, I need you to wrap up. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I want to thank this panel. Uh, oh, oh, Lisa, you're 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 there too. That's why I made sure I got your chair at the table. So let's let's swap out chairs. And if everyone can move over a little bit that way, we can make sure all five chairs are there for the next panel as well. All right. There we go. Oh, make sure it's on. Now, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences at NYU, where I teach courses on sustainability. I am also the conservation chair of the Sierra Club New York City group, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Sierra Club to express our support for Intro 1055 2018, Intro 272 2018, and Intro 1399 2019. These bills are especially important given the fall 2018 UN IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and the U.S. National Climate Assessment, the 2019 New York City Panel on Climate Change Report, and most recently the May 2019 UN Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. I will begin with Intro 272 and 1055 which address the public health risks from dangerous gas leaks and complement the measurement of methane emissions in New York City's annual mandated inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. New York City's methane footprint actually begins in the shale gas fields of states like Pennsylvania and includes hundreds of miles of pipelines, such as the Spectra pipeline that transport frack gas to New York City. I, and I just want to know, note that many council members, staff, and activists here opposed the Spectra pipeline when it was being proposed. Uh, within New York City, we have a vast natural gas infrastructure that comprises the gas mains in the streets, the service lines that bring gas from streets to buildings, and all the gas pipes within buildings for gas boilers, gas washers and dryers, and gas stoves. An accurate measure of methane emissions within New York City is crucial, as has been pointed out over a 20 year period, Methane is 86 times more effective than carbon dioxide in trapping heat in our atmosphere. To facilitate the reduction of methane emissions, we recommend new legislation in the near future, mandating the installation in all new buildings of electric or electromagnetic stoves, 
electric washers and dryers, and heating and cooling systems that do not require fossil fuels. The Sierra Club also supports intro 1399-2019, introduced by Council Member Constantinides, which would replace the existing Office of Sustainability with the new Department of Sustainability and Climate Change. The provisions of this bill include a mandated ident identification and assessment of sustainability indicators that not only reduce our negative impact on the environment, but also contribute to the vibrancy of ecosystem services in New York City. These positive indicators include prevention of biodiversity loss, increasing the number and quality of trees in the city urban forests, increases in renewable energy generation, and air quality improvements. In an interview entitled, Redesigning Cities with Nature's Technology, Janine Banyas, a biologist and pioneer of biomimicry, innovations inspired by nature, explains the concept of ecological performance standards for cities, which are comparable to the positive sustainability indicators. Instead of degrading nature with greenhouse gas emissions, air and water pollution, impermeable surfaces, and increased temperatures, cities must produce ecological systems, such as filtering air and water, storing water and releasing it slowly, sequestering carbon, replenishing soil, and supporting pollinators. With regard to the proposed Sustainability Advisory Board, this board should include Passive House certified architects, as Passive House is an international building efficiency standard that saves up to 90% of the energy required for heating and cooling conventional buildings, and 75% of all energy usage when electricity is included in the total. Finally, as the first report of the new Department of Sustainability and Climate Change is to be submitted by April 22, 2020, the Sierra Club recommends the introduction of a city council resolution in commemoration of the 50-year anniversary of the first Earth Day on April 22, 1970. This could be modeled on the council's resolution and hearing in support of the September 21, 2014 People's Climate March, in which over 400,000 people from throughout the world participated, including council members and staff and environmental activists attending and participating in today's hearing. And this hearing will provide an opportunity to assess our achievements and failures since Earth Day 1970, <clears throat> and to outline future initiatives for preventing catastrophic climate change and environmental challenge that was unimaginable in 1970. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, thank you to all these panelists uh, to bringing your different perspectives here today. And uh, we're going to continue to have this conversation to push forward. So I appreciate all of you being here and, and lending us your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, coming forward, uh, Nancy Romer from Professional Staff Congress, CUNY, People's Climate Movement, uh, Vincent uh, Brancato from New York Safety for Ethical Culture, oh, Society for Ethical Culture, sorry. Uh, Margaret Perkins from 350.org. Uh, Molly uh, Ornati from 350 Brooklyn. Uh, Ruth Hardinger. Okay, and I think like we're, are we missing one person from that panel that I just called? Yes. Just, all right, so let me call um, Marion uh, Innes, is, uh, I'm sorry, Inez, I, I'm sorry, I can't read the handwriting, I apologize, I left my glasses. Uh, Mary Yen, I'm sorry, but I, I can't read my, gla I left my glasses home today, so I apologize for that. <laughs> sorry about that, Mary. All right, so I started on this side with the last panel. Let's start on this side uh, and this go around. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the City Council. 
My name is Molly Ornati, and I am a co-facilitator of 350 Brooklyn, one of more than 170 U.S. chapters of the International Climate Change Organization, 350.org, with a membership of 2,200 people. Thank you for listening to my testimony in support of Intro 1399. I also fully support the passage of Intro 1055 and 272, but we'll leave it to others with more expertise to provide that testimony. We know that climate change is a crisis whose dimension and proportion has never been previously encountered by human civilization. It will strike every aspect of our lives, from shelter, energy, and infrastructure, to food supply and health. Massive dislocation and suffering is predictable. Human survival is not. This international city of eight million people and great cultural, financial, and historic importance has no centralized plan. While progress has been made under the mayor's office uh, to improve sustainability and the transition to renewable energy, the gaps between the stated goals and implementation remains too large. The proposed Department of Sustainability and Climate Change, a full-fledged city agency with a budget, commissioner, advisory board, and oversight process, is, cru <coughs> excuse me, is, is crucial for the massive organization and integration of the citywide labor force and people of specialized expertise with new technology to create a plan and coordinate with all city other agencies. As, as the bill states, its purview will include reducing greenhouse gas emissions, addressing sea level rise, protecting vulnerable populations, prevention of biodiversity loss, waste in landfills, etc. Given the real challenges we have seen in providing housing, just housing for all city residents, the need to begin to create a city department to address these enormous and complex problems cannot be overstated. I commend the City Council for its recent passage of the Climate Mobilization Act. The bill calls for retrofitting 5,000 buildings a year, but there are more than one million structures in New York City. We need to accelerate the retrofit accelerator. The process needs to move forward at a different pace. Without sufficient funding, capacity, and oversight, any laws that are passed will be meaningless if there aren't the resources, both human and financial, for implementation. As citizens, we implore the government to find the moral vision and courage to pr prioritize the survival of our citizens and our city, take action and move forward. We are behind you, ready to mobilize, able to sacrifice, and eager to get to work. Okay. Hi, thank you for letting this talk. Um, this is comments from Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, an organization that I've been working with. Um, and the comment is delivered by Ruth Hardinger. That's my name. Methane CH4 is a colorless, orderless gas in the wide description of nature. The CH4 name describes the atoms of the methane molecules with carbon di uh, with with one carbon and four hydrogen oxen. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. It degrades over the initial half-time life of eight to 12 years in the atmosphere, and then it converts into carbon dioxide. However, it has much higher global warming potential than, carbon di than CO2, carbon dioxide. There are three different sources of methane gas, including thermogenic, it's a deep geologi, geologi um, anthropogenic, it's human activities, and biogenic from living organizations, methane. Natural gas is composed of 90 to 90% 90 methane. Mostly thermogenic methane is delivered to end users, contains other chemicals, including radioactive radon. 
The global warming potential of the CH4 has been upgraded by the IPCC to at least 86 to 80 times stronger than carbon dioxide during a 20-year time frame over in the gas in this is the gas in this atmosphere. Methane grouped with other near-term climate forces such as black carbon, hydrofluorin carbon, and arsenals. It's the most likely greenhouse gas escalating the planetary heat now because it is so much of it is released. We have a few minute measurements of the gas leakage from the wells and pipelines. The measurements that have been made found sustainable um, concentration, con no, excuse my word here, concentrations of the methane in the atmosphere from the leaks. Further, the EPA comparisons of methane of carbon dioxide on the wonder, the wonder year time frame claims methane is only 34 times stronger than carbon dioxide, hiding the real impact of the CH4's new term presence. Simply, the 100 year frame does not acknowledge methane the half-life impact. Caracas or Janus of methane plumes downwill on the natural gas compressor stations in Pennsylvania and in New York is a peer-reviewed paper that uses an actual measurements of the methanes. That's a proxy of natural gas is a mixture. To look at the emissions from the natural gas compressors that, that push the gas through pipelines and negative air quality impacts those emissions. The extraction of the unventional oil and gas, natural gas from the shale energy resources has raised concerns about the upstream and the midstream activists and the potential impacts of air quality. Here we present in measurements of the ambient, the ambient methane concentrations near multiple natural gas compressor stations in New York and Pennsylvania using the cavity ring down laser spectrometry, um, coupled with global um, positioning systems technology. These data re reveal discernible, <coughs> Discernible, discernible, that's the word. <clears throat> um, methane plumes located promoxily and the compressor stations which ex would exhibit high viability for the methane emissions depending upon the weather conditions and on-site activities. During the atmosphere temperature inversions, when the near ground mixing of the atmosphere is limited, or does not occur, residents and properties located within one mile of the compressor station can be exposed to robed methane from the point sources. I, excuse me, I'm sorry, can you, can you wrap up? That's it. That's it, okay, great, thank you. That's thank the you. ends of it. And I have, a, a, I brought some papers that are here, and they also say a little bit more about the scientists and the other things here from Damascus citizens. It's at the bottom part of this thing, and it's a good thing to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up. Hi. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Vincent Brancato, and I am the co-chair of the Environmental Stewardship Committee of the New York Society for Ethical Culture here in New York. I'm retired from a career in the industrial sector, mostly the steel industry, and I have been active in trying to protect our natural assets for many years. I am also an Al Gore trained climate reality leader in his climate reality project. Carbon dioxide is the big greenhouse gas, 82% of US greenhouse gas emitted. Methane is only 10%. However, these gases have different lifespans and different potencies. Methane is more than 25 times more potent than CO2 in the first 100 years after admission. <laughs> Methane is the actual natural gas or shale gas if mined by hydrofracking. 
that is the fossil fuel before we burn it. Methane is not like coal or oil or gasoline fossil fuel waiting to be burned. Methane is constantly waiting to escape from tanks, pipelines, or compression stations to become the hazardous greenhouse gas it can be. This is at all stages of its existence, during mining, refining, transport, and storage until it is burned, making CO2, or until it escapes, uh, becoming methane in the atmosphere. The first of the three bills I would like to address is 272, the proposal that the DEP inspects and surveys for leaks of methane within all city old buildings. I applaud that proposal and I would suggest three modifications. First is that the surveys be completed for all buildings within the first 12 months after the law takes effect. The second is that the found leaks should have, no, should have to be repaired within 30 days of discovery unless they are more urgent. And the final one is that the gas, connect, gas line connections to the buildings from the main gas lines be also inspected when the building is checked. As this law also indicates that every building in this city has to be surveyed for methane leaks, I would suggest that for privately owned buildings, the initial surveys be completed within six months from passage of the bill, and that the review again is every five years. The additional requirement of each rental unit to be surveyed again upon vacancy for leaks should also be imposed on all units, be they publicly or privately owned. The second bill, number 1055, is a critical partner to 272, requiring surveying and mapping of all methane leaks in the city as a way to close the biggest possible source of leakage and dangers of fire and explosions. I would suggest some changes to this bill. First, if a leak is found, it should have to be repaired within 45 days, not 90 days. I think the involved utility should, be, should have to compensate the city for the cost of finding such leaks. If one of the city's designated agencies should have to make a repair, they should seek cost recovery from the utility. The final bill I would address is number 1399, the proposal to replace the existing Office of Stability with a new, more empowered Department of Sustainability and Climate Change. <coughs> In this time of climate crisis threatening our sustainability, I have to fully support this plan to make long-term an empowered department to plan for and implement necessary steps to try to make our path through the coming decades smoother and help protect and improve the quality of life for all our citizens. We at the New York Society for Ethical Culture are really thankful for this opportunity to present our views. Since our founding in 1876, the society has participated in working for the public good from our participation in starting the Settlement House Movement, helping start the Visiting Nurse Service, and supporting the ACLU and NAACP as they were founded. This opportunity to participate in this hearing is very, very much appreciated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Stay, please stay at the panel for any questions at the end. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Margaret Perkins and I'm here on behalf of 350 NYC uh, and we're here to support intro 1055, 272 and 1399. And I ask the question of everyone here, why are we here? Why are we in this room debating this topic once again? And the two reasons are, number one, New York City burns 600 trillion BTU of natural gas per year, the largest of any city in North America. We are addicted to natural gas. And um, the second reason is that there has been a massive failure of utilities, regulatory agencies, state governments, and we know the national government, to regulate leaks, production leaks, and uh, transport leaks, of natural gas, methane. And um, if you research the internet, you see that actually California is the only state that has any regulatory uh, policies in place that regulate um, leaks, repair of leaks, reduction of leaks. New York State does not. So this, these laws, at least in, in part 272, 1055, would begin to look at that issue of, of the leaks and holding the utilities accountable. But the major problem is, as Bob Weiner talked before, is our addiction to natural gas. 
And we have not, in the last five years, the actual level has increased. And these are the two beautiful graphs that the greenhouse gas inventory has produced in the last two years. And in 2015, we, we, uh, the emissions from natural gas was 16.2 uh, million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And in the last year, it was up to 17. 0.2 uh, million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. So it's going up, our use of uh, natural gas. This is through direct use in the heating and also what um, is uh, powering the, the power plants to produce electricity. So we're not going down. Um, also, just one correction. I know the city always says uh, point, uh, our methane leakage within the city gates, within the local distribution system is 0.7% of total greenhouse gases, but in their own table here, it's actually uh, 1%. So it's, it's significant. Um, so just to continue, uh, it's, you know, we have the issue of methane leaks, which is uh, the, the, vent, the uh, venting and the, the leaks further upfield in the, in the um, wells and the transport. You have deliberate venting, which we have to account for. In, within the city, in the city gates, as the um, fire department said, they had 23,000 calls for leaks last year, which is astronomical. Um, but the, the answer is, is, okay, we can survey them, we can prepare them, but the answer is not to use natural gas. That is the answer, and we have to tackle that now. We've got 11 more years. I know that 1253 is going to go halfway, maybe 40% towards that, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, and then one last issue about natural gas is that we often overlook the fact that it contains natural gas, 95%, 99% is methane, but there are also other volatile organic compounds that are components of natural gas. And some of those are building blocks for ground level ozone, which we know is a trigger for asthma and other respiratory conditions. So it's not just methane, which is odorless, which by itself does not cause health problems, but there are other gases in the natural gas. Uh, so to finish up, okay, to finish up, um, uh, two suggestions. One is on 1055, it could be strengthened. Uh, all buildings, it suggests all buildings be surveyed for leaks and the leaks repaired, I think it said originally in one form said within 90 days. I think that the utilities have the capacity, hopefully if it's a serious large leak to repair immediately, I don't know what. And then um, old buildings with um, cast iron piping should be a priority. They're the ones that seem to have the largest leaks and the more, more um, frequent leaks. And then in relation to intro 272, um, the leak survey, the suggestion is that every, it be done every five years, but we suggest once again that the older buildings be, that are at risk be identified first. And we strongly support the creation of the new department. It will add money and capacity to uh, roll out these phenomenal bills that we passed April 18th. Thank you. Due to Councilman Costantinidis, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy thank Swift. you. Ms. Yen, sorry about yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. You're up next. Perfect. You want me to move over here? And uh, you can go on that side, either one. Good afternoon, Mr. Constantinides and everyone. My name is Marion Yin. I want to speak in support of intro 1399 to amend the city charter and administrative code. As you know, the staff report of the Charter Review Commission does not mention the biggest elephant in the room, massive environmental degradation and global crisis we live in. Last year, I submitted to the commission a proposal to establish an agency that champions and grows a healthy, ongoing and dynamic relationship of our city with nature. That is why I'm so glad to see this intro, 1399, and I sincerely trust that you will secure adequate funding for its implementation. We need to help New Yorkers face our common reality that we humans are part of nature 
and that the natural elements are on loan to us on this planet, that we cohabitate with many other species and other forms of life. In support of intro 1399, I want to offer the following to strengthen your intention. According to the text, the proposed department would be responsible for recovery, resilience, and sustainability. Now, even though these words are very commonly used, I decided to look up the dictionary definition. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and, tough, and being tough, or it's the ability of, to spring back into shape. Sustainability is the, ability, it's the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level, or the avoidance of depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. Now, Mr. Chairman, surely you must not mean returning to the status quo that we're in, given the massive environmental degradation and changes already precipitated by the climate crisis. As we approach the irreversible thresholds that scientists tell us about, we will find that more and more aspects of our lives will be impacted by the rapid changes, including public health, increasing inequity and conflict. And it will, and it will be impossible to predefine which and how our municipal services would be impacted. So I strongly recommend that you include language on two things. One is just transition. We must recognize that burden and benefits of the changes fall unequally on New Yorkers. Will our city's response take us to a healthier, more equitable, and more meaningful democracy? The second thing I want to suggest you include is um, a direction for the long-term plan. I think that this plan must take us to a regenerative society where there is a partnership between nature and humanity, where 21st century technology helps us benefit from nature's gifts and renewable resources. We can and we must tap into nature's regenerative systems and her power. Humans cannot do it alone, but humans must get the implementation of this bill funded. Nature will, will be our friend and partner if we will let her. Thank you. Thank you, and I thank all of you for being here today and testifying and, and bringing your expertise to this panel and to this hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I wanna bring forward uh, Philip Kahn from the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, Kyle Jeremiah from Energy Vision, uh, Wendy Brawler from Green Map, uh, Richard Kramer from Action Corps in uh, New York State, and Kim uh, Frozick from uh, St. Energy Project. I'm, I'm, that's why I have some people on a clock. That's why we're trying to keep things moving. I'm doing the best I possibly can. I understand. I mean, I'm going as fast as I can. Okay, we've, we've been here for about two and a half hours. We're trying to get things moving. Okay, well, we're trying. We're doing our best. Okay, all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I guess we could begin here on this side. Yep. Mm -hmm. We certainly need a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change. I'm Wendy Brower, Director of Green Map System and a sustainability and climate design professional with 30 years of experience. I'm a longtime Lower East Side resident who has volunteered on waterfront planning even prior to Sandy. I watched as the innovative plan for the Big U morphed from a community-engaged natural systems-based design that made room for the water into an untested plan, a uh, drastic plan, that, um, and process that pits neighbors against one another, sows mistrust of all the agency involved, and destroys the 58-acre park for f just a couple decades of protection. Some years from now, the restored 1930s East River Park will have abundant concrete and turf field, but less room for nature, skinny trees that can't absorb much stormwater or pollutants, and it'll be ringed by the congestion pricing free zone on the uncapped FDR, further burdening the most vulnerable residents who are already stressed out by the thought of another standing, Sandy during the unprotected years of construction. In a case in point for needing a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change that oversees the NYC Department of City Planning and Parks, this winter I wrote about the city's uncoordinated approach in a blog for the eastriveralliance.org website. It's attached. This, the lack of systems thinking in planned and tested planning means we won't get much for the $1.5 billion when there are a multitude of issues and conditions that could be addressed with a world-class plan. In February, I requested and CB3 resolved to support the Lower East Side Street Tree Canopy, which is an immediate commencement of planting and stewardship programming. And while parks promised a thousand street trees, nothing has happened since, and they never mention stewardship when they point to this problem. Pro promise. They don't understand the role of social resiliency and how it was proven by Sandy and many other disruptions that communities that trust each other and already work together in gardens, in parks, etc., bounce back faster. So disdainful of community participation, Parks doesn't even mention the Lower East Side Ecology Center on their signage, despite it being in the park 20 years, turning food waste into healthy soil and managing stewardship throughout the park. This is one small example of why we need a high-level, transparent department to help us navigate the uncharted waters ahead. I'm, I'm also providing a statement from Kathleen Webster, who's president of the Sarah D. Roosevelt Park Coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. This is the panel. My name's Richenda Kramer, and I'm speaking for Action Core New York City. Action Core was started by um, Oxfam 12 years ago, Oxfam America 12 years ago, and um, we had to separate when Oxfam became a confederation. Um, we're an all-volunteer group, and we work with um, climate change, primarily with climate change and vulnerable people who are affected by it and also who are affected by violent conflict. And we would like to support all three bills. But um, as a Staten Islander and an Action Corps member, I was particularly interested in the 2014 study of methane leaks on Staten Island which was done by the EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, Colorado University, and three Google cars, which mapped the entire island. The study found that 1,000 tons of methane per year was being emitted through these leaks in my borough, and which number, I assume, has probably increased. In 2014, the national grid declared that these leaks did not constitute a health hazard, and as most of the leaks were minor ones, so nothing had to be done about it. Um, the effect on the environment and on climate change was not addressed. In late 2016, the national grid started taking the 
issue more seriously and is now using new techniques to find and map and hopefully repair methane leaks. But it's important that the national grid pays for the repairs and that they not be placed on the backs of taxpayers. The national grid is a private, for-profit company and will do the minimum required by law and public opinion. The current work is a start, but it's an issue that must be addressed in all boroughs and dealt with more forcefully as a department, as your bill addresses, but also a how to have a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change would be even better. Um, Staten Island had the largest landfill in the world from 1948 until 2001, 2001, and it was built on wetlands, and it was ironically called the Fresh Kills Landfill. Kill means river. Um, it received an massive amount of all waste. There was no division between toxic and non-toxic waste for many years, um, though the solid waste ended in 1996. Um, it, the smell was horrendous and the healthcare problems were enormous in the area. Um, it was permanently capped in 2008 and a 22,000 acre park should be completed by 2030 because it's going to take that long to sort out the problems that the landfill has created. The methane, the methane that it generated is presumably now moving through the underground water system since it's no longer coming up for air and it's still there to be released. Um, so, we're very grateful that City Council passed the Landmark Mobilization Act, which makes the development of a Department for Sustainability and Climate Change the long, next logical step. Climate change is already with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kyle Jaramaya, and I am the Communications and Community Engagement Manager at Energy Vision, a New York City-based National Environmental 501c3 organization. Since our founding in 2007, we have been promoting clean, renewable, and low carbon energy and fuel solutions through research, education, and partnerships. I'd like to thank the chairman for this opportunity to testify on the proposed legislation. Uh, given concerns about the city's ability to achieve its ambitious goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, it is critical to have legislation that enhances institutional capacity to address this existential challenge. As such, Energy Vision fully supports the creation of a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change to replace the existing Office of Sustainability to deal with matters relating to the resiliency of critical infrastructure, the built environment, coastal protection, coastal communities, and climate change. Energy Vision also supports empowering the proposed department to develop and coordinate policies and strategies to meet the long-term climate and environmental needs of the city. We believe an interagency green team would help to facilitate and advance the implementation of innovative technologies and strategies that have significant environmental and sustainability benefits. Having spent more than a decade looking at proven but underdeployed clean energy solutions, we would encourage the proposed Department of Sustainability and Climate Change to explore the suite of all potential solutions toward achieving our critical climate goals. One such strategy addressing both waste disposal and clean energy is the co-digestion of commercial food scraps, a major climate and solid waste liability in the existing anaerobic digesters at many of the city's 14 wastewater treatment plants. The biogases captured from these decomposing organic wastes, sewage and food waste, could then be upgraded to net carbon neutral biomethane and used to power these same facilities, fuel vehicles, or heat New York City buildings. 
this particular example would be a bold, important initiative for the proposed department as it both captures potent methane gases from organic waste that would otherwise escape into the atmosphere and creates a flexible source of baseload renewable energy. The proposal calling for the creation of a sustainability advisory board with representatives from environmental and other groups is equally essential given the various types and levels of expertise required for us to rise to the challenge of addressing our climate change and related public health obstacles. If our environmental goals are to be met, we need a well-informed, fully empowered agency to help guide the various approaches that can help decarbonize various sectors while improving air, water and soil quality, public health and the economy. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Next up, how are you? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kim Fracek. I'm the director of Saint Energy Project. We represent 7,500 New Yorkers working for the past decade to halt fossil fuel infrastructure and move our economy to 100% renewable, community-led and community-owned. Um, it's a pleasure to work with such a forward-thinking city council, and I thank you for your valiant efforts to address climate change as the crisis that it is in our beloved waterfront city. Uh, we support the interbills proposed today, and uh, that will give additional uh, solid infrastructure to a desperately needed clear plan to 100% renewable energy for New York City. We know that we cannot rely on the corporate utilities to be an honest voice in this renewable transition. As we heard in the very room next door on April 15th, 2019, in the hearing to pass the resolution against the williams Nessie pipeline by Con Ed representatives Ivan Kimball and Kyle Kimball, uh, claiming that methane gas supply constraints in New York City to justify building a heinous pipeline in order to bring profit to none other than Williams, Con Ed, and National Grid shareholders and stick all of us footing the bill. Their testimony was counter to a report issued by Suzanne Matei, former DEC regional director, that we do not need more gas supply. Further, they continued to say that fracked gas was renewable gas several times in their testimony and that they had no plan for renewables other than waiting for the market to work first when asked by Speaker Johnson. Uh, there are four proposed methane projects in the city of New York right now, and I would like to highlight uh, them to create a sense of urgency that we need to make this legislation happen as soon as possible in order to shut down any further expansion or repowering of gas. $200 million um, is being asked by Con Edison ratepayers to expand, not replace pipelines in their network in the current rate case, uh, a proposed LNG storage expansion in Astoria, Queens, and the repowering of the Astoria generating station in Sunset Park. And now we have the reapplication of Williams Nessie pipeline. The legislation proposed to reduce, reduce methane emissions and to survey and map emissions is one of the most important things that we can do today. Additionally, changing our city charter to create a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change is something we should have done long ago. And because we are not truly addressing climate change unless we are addressing the inequitable economic model for which fossil fuels thrive. I would recommend that we have strong environmental justice standards for this proposed department's goals by taking directions from communities and organizations already doing this work. Uh, to be honest, I see that our state and city administrations are making choices that are front-facing, but prevent genuine renewable and economic implementation. We heard from Janie Bavici, uh, in the aforementioned hearing, Mayor de Blasio's Director of Recovery and Resiliency, that natural slash methane gas is clean and needed. And now we see the mayor announce a deal with a Canadian hydropower in lieu of fighting for offshore wind jobs right in our own backyard. This is the wrong direction for our renewable future. I uh, attached an article uh, about the hydro, Canadian hydro deal, uh, and why it's the wrong direction for New York City. Um, additionally, we heard from Governor Cuomo to say on the Brian Lehrer show that the Climate and Community Protection Act is a, quote, political placebo and that we can't do it. So what kind of climate leadership is that and what kind of, where is the democracy if both the state Senate and Assembly want to enact this policy? We don't have time to wait anymore and what, uh, what we do here in New York this year 
can set off a domino effect for national climate action. We look forward, uh, we look forward to continue working with the New York City Council on helping develop any plans on halting the climate disaster methane and replacing it with clean heat solutions available now at NYSERDA if we stick together to get funding to make renewable heat now happen for every resident of New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of your testimony here today and everything that you're all doing uh, to make our city greener and a more sustainable place. So thank you. Thanks. Next up, um, I want to bring forward uh, Karen uh, Blondell, uh, resilient Renhook, uh, Gustavo or Gordillo, uh, New York Democratic Socialists of America, uh, Amber Ruther, uh, New York uh, City Democratic Socialists of America Eco Socialist Working Group, uh, Lee Zij from St. Energy Project, and Eileen Moran. Okay, so I'll just, okay. so I'll call one more person forward then to replace her on the panel, then uh, Ashley Dawson from 350.org. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll start right here. Thank you, because I'm gonna have to run right out. Um, I actually took the time to come here today because this is really important to me. I appreciate and that. And sitting here and listening about um, methane and about a um, combined office of sustainability um, and resiliency and climate change, um, I didn't hear any mention about the fact that all winter long, 70% of the buildings in New York City lose energy because they are overheating in the winter, mm -hmm. and where, me, me? I'm putting on my air conditioner every day in the winter time because I can't breathe in my apartment. These are public housing apartments. Mm -hmm. It's one in 14 New Yorkers live in public housing, and none of this conversation was about public housing. It just wasn't. It wasn't, so even if we solve all of these other problems, you still got one in 15 New Yorkers still with the same problem. So that has to be addressed. Okay. And that's addressed through, uh, unfortunately, not every building's gonna be ready for passive house. Public housing, New York City Housing Authority is definitely not ready for passive house. They will have to go to um, gas first through the energy performance contract so that they can buy the controls that they need inside the buildings and also train their heating plant technicians on how to read those gauges and to adjust the energy in the building. That is going to save and, and reduce the energy and the greenhouse gases, but each, each type of building is gonna have to be done uh, separately and you're gonna have to take a look at the condition, the age of the building and et cetera. So now I'm gonna go back to what I wrote. Um, the resilient, commit, uh, resilient Red Hook Committee is made up of concerned residents working together to steer the future of Red Hook and beyond. Empowered by the spirit of unity that helped the Red Hook community survive Hurricane Sandy, our vision for a resilient and thriving future is to work as a holistic community to strengthen Red Hook by minimizing differences and maximizing cooperation among all who live and work here. We are using social cohesion to bring in um, uh, 350 Brooklyn, to bring in um, a resiliency education training and innovation center. We are looking from the ground at the people who have to live in these buildings who smell gas all the time and won't report it. You know why? Because in public housing, when they report a gas problem, usually they don't have gas for the next six to nine months. Mm -hmm. So why would they report it? Like, it's almost like they'd rather be dead than report it, which is ridiculous. I agree. Um, <clears throat> mindful of the growing climate-related risk, to our beloved community and the immediate need for improved emergency preparedness measures around climate change and sea level rise, our actions will serve to help the develop, to develop measures that will protect our neighborhood from flood inundation, 
increase the safety of our citizens and move towards a resilient com community. That has to take place at the ground. Each community is different. We're asking to be that pilot program in Red Hook and Gowanus because we deal with lowlands, uh, flooding. Um, um, we have a lot of architects and a lot of 350BK members living around us, and we just feel that we're diverse enough and in integrated enough to come together where we have public housing residents and undergraduates speaking about marine biology, speaking about resiliency and, and how they can reduce their need to put on a light in an apartment by just a, a, a flashing at the window. This is stuff we get from young people. I'm not young enough to come up with this stuff, but we have to encourage our young people to come up with these answers and these solutions, and they're not at the table. Also missing from this package to, um, where we want these agencies to work together is the, is the uh, Department of Health and the public health officials. They always were a part of things during the sanitary condition. We're going back to that. We're now seeing more infectious diseases and different things happening related to climate change. We have to bring the epi epidemiologists into the picture as well. And I'll just leave the testimony. I'm sorry I'm gonna have to leave without hearing the rest of you guys, but I did try to stay as long as I could, but I have some other business I have to attend to for Fifth Avenue Committee. So thank, thank you for you. coming today. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Amber Ruther. I'm here representing the NYC Democratic Socialists of America. I'm in the Eco Socialist Working Group. Um, first off, I want to thank you, especially Costa Constantinides, for your leadership on climate justice. Um, and I want to say that I believe the Department of Sustainability and Climate Change is greatly needed. Um, addressing the climate crisis at the scope and speed necessary while ensuring equity and a just transition will be no easy feat. It will require massive levels of coordination among every agency from the Department of Buildings to DCAS. Methods of delivering services that have been in place for decades will need to be carefully rethought according to ecological and environmental justice principles and in many cases completely overhauled. As an auditor for the city, I have found that the largest challenges that city agencies face in achieving their goals are often a lack of resources, oversight, coordination with other city agencies, and enforcement mechanisms. And this department would remedy many of those challenges. However, I'm concerned that there don't appear to be any enforcement mechanisms if agencies fail to meet their stated goals. I'm also concerned that the members of the Sustainability Advisory Board are all appointed, not elected, and they are not required to seek input from the communities their decisions will impact the most. Despite best intentions, they may be unaware of the challenges and trade-offs certain communities face, and as a result, their decisions may have unintended consequences. Especially when it comes to disaster relief and resiliency, input from frontline communities is critical. Resiliency plans cannot be designed to serve only the rich and powerful, but should center and prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. The advisory board could hold regular town halls publicized with the Civic Engagement Commission or provide an opportunity for online input, perhaps in conjunction with a participatory budgeting platform. This would not only allow the advisory board to receive input from the community, but to get buy-in and address any concerns that arise. It would also reduce the amount of planning they'll need to do from scratch, as many communities and grassroots organizations have been developing policy ideas, 197A plans, and resiliency plans for decades, which simply mean, need to be implemented, funded, and expanded. For instance, Uprose's community-owned solar cooperative in Sunset Park would provide the city with an excellent model of how to expand access to solar in a way that is affordable for all and centers frontline communities. They hope to turn the waterfront into a manufacturing hub for wind turbines to combat gentrification. Furthermore, advocates have requested that the city retrofit NYCHA by involving, training, and hiring NYCHA residents instead of relying on public-private partnerships. A just transition must be frontline and grassroots-led. These communities already have solutions. What they need most is for their input to be listened to and prioritized. 
Um, and since I have a minute, I would also like to echo something that was stated earlier by Bob Wyman regarding the methane emissions bill. Um, I applaud your effort to identify leaks and um, would like to emphasize that it is going to be often more expensive to replace pipelines um, than it is to just simply implement renewable energy instead. Um, so that should absolutely be taken in, into account, but as we've seen uh, many times, Con Ed will fight renewables every step of the way uh, and lobby against them and use scare tactics to make them seem unfeasible. So in my opinion, it would be a more efficient use of the city's resource to explore options to municipalize our energy system or to expand NIPA to allow them to um, purchase renewable energy instead of relying on these private corporations who at the end of the day will always be incentivized to prioritize profit over people and the planet. Um, for instance, one of the hugest issues that is um, preventing people from owning solar and energy efficiency is the fixed charge that Con Ed charges. Um, there's currently a bill on the table to remove this, but unfortunately, removing the fixed charge would hurt Con Ed's profits, so they would not be incentivized to promote energy efficiency. Um, and these are fundamental conflicts of interest that arise from privately owned utilities. And I hope that the city will consider uh, exploring opportunities for publicly owned utilities in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Costa, uh, Council Member Constantinides. Costa's um, fine. <laughs> I'm Gustavo Gordillo, and I'm a member of the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, the largest socialist organization in the United States. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of our eco-socialist working group. And before I begin, I'd like to support um, Bob Wyman's proposal to amend intro 1055 to encourage the abandonment of leaking gas infrastructure and not only its repair. Um, I applaud your effort to reduce methane emissions, which are 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide. However, I believe the city must do more to address the root cause behind the relentless expansion of fracked gas infrastructure and methane leaks in our community. Uh, this legislation is an attempt to address grid neglect, and it's needed because of the private utilities' coordinated resistance to abandon deadly gas infrastructure. Con Edison and National Grid are investor-owned utilities whose primary goal is to maximize shareholder profits at the expense of workers, communities, and the environment. The city should not need to inform Con Ed and National Grid of where upgrade and repair efforts should be made. That should be their responsibility. It's going to be cost-intensive, cost and this is just one more way that Con Ed and National Grid will externalize the costs of fossil fuels onto us, the public. The city's limited resources would be better spent addressing Con Ed and National Grid's consistent ability to act as a barrier to the transition to renewable energy. We should make Con Ed and National Grid public, publicly owned utilities and focus our efforts on replacing crumbling fossil fuel infrastructure with renewables instead of using public money to clean up their mess. The risks of private, private utilities are currently socialized, while their profits are privatized. As we have seen with PG&E in California, in our existing system, when a private utility neglects the grid and causes loss of life, we, the public, pay the costs, and utility investors are ultimately bailed out by ratepayers and taxpayers. If we socialized the profits of Con Ed, we would have over $1 billion more each year to spend on renewable energy infrastructure. Not to mention, we would be avoiding the $9.5 million CEO salaries, the $1.5 million strike contingency funds, and money that the utilities spend on lobbyists. In, tw in 2018, Con Ed paid $889 million in dividends to stockholders, and National Grid USA paid $549 million in dividends to stockholders. These dividends were paid on the backs of ratepayers, 
and amount to massive wealth transfer from ordinary New Yorkers to the wealthiest members of society who make up these investors. This is where money should be coming from to abandon gas and build renewables. A public distribution utility could be achieved by either municipalizing the grid, as over 2,000 cities have already done, or by working with the state to expand the New York Power Authority's ability to purchase new energy generation and add new customers. Studies have shown that on average, publicly owned utilities are more affordable, safer, and can have a greater share of renewable energy than investor owned utilities. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Next. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here. My name is Ashley Dawson. I'm a professor of environmental studies at the City University of New York. I'm here at the invitation of 350.org, and I'm also a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, so I second all the points that my fellow panelists have made. Um, we all know that the city and the world face a climate emergency. In their report on global warming of 1.5 degrees last October, the UN's IPCC warned that the world will hurdle past the 1.5 degree target by 2050. Unless we engage in a sweeping transformation of energy, land, infrastructure, and manufacturing, the authors of the report argued that saving the planet from climate breakdown will involve, and this is their language, systems transition, for which there's no documented historic precedent. And of course, according to the IPCC, we only have about a decade to make these radical cuts. So New York City must act quickly and decisively. The city's taken some important and historic steps in recent years to cope with the unfolding climate emergency, but all too often these successes have taken far too long to push through. For example, Mayor de Blasio initially announced a program to encourage landlords to voluntarily cut emissions from their buildings way back in 2015. But it wasn't until this past April that the Climate Mobilization Act made such cuts mandatory. That's four precious years wasted. And from what I understand, the measure contains a provision that will allow owners to buy renewable energy credits in order to offset their continuing use of fossil-based energy. Environmental justice organizations in the city and around the world have been strongly opposed to such offsetting programs since they allow wealthy landlords not just to continue polluting, but to avoid upgrading their buildings, thereby stripping um, the promise of good green jobs out of the bill. And so I think this suggests why the um, intro 1399 provision to include an oversight board um, that represents the city and various movements within the city is very important. We're still waiting for some other ambitious promises uh, from the city to become reality. During uh, Mayor de Blasio's first electoral campaign, for instance, he declared that he would sit, set the city on a path to zero waste, ensuring that 90% of city refuse would be diverted from landfills by 2030. This initiative is way behind schedule. Organic waste accounts for one third of the city's waste stream. That's an estimated one million tons of compostable material being sent to landfills annually instead of turned into good soil. I personally compost, but to do so, I have to put food scraps in my freezer for the week and then schlep them to the local farmer's market every Sunday morning which uh, is not so bad, but it's certainly not an arrangement conducive to dedicated waste recycling in a city with some of the lowest rates of recycling in the country. So in sum, New York City desperately needs a powerful centralized agency to coordinate efforts to improve sustainability and resilience. The city needs uh, an agency and a commissioner to prioritize the fight against climate breakdown and to coordinate the overlapping and at times contradictory goals of multiple municipal offices charged with implementing the city's climate goals. In addition to creating such a centralized agency, intro 1399, which I'm firmly in support of, also establishes much needed public oversight of the city's bureaucracy through the creation of a board of experts, advocates, academics, and industry experts that will hold the newly created agency and commissioner accountable. And I already uh, cited one instance for why that kind of oversight is so important in the current climate. The science has told us that there's no time to waste in addressing the climate emergency. Let's make New York City an example of how it is possible to move forward with unity and determination in the face of this existential threat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your testimony today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, calling the next panel, uh, Catherine Skopik, uh, Ari Lieberman, 350 Brooklyn, uh, Jackie Weisberg, 350 Brooklyn, 
uh, Gregory uh, uh, Schweidach, uh, the, the Climate Mobilization, New York City. So let me see, you are? Yeah. And you are? Yeah. Okay, so I think a couple of the people had to leave. So uh, uh, Kate Lamort, are you still in the room? Okay. Uh, Christian Cruz, are you still in the room? Yeah. Yes, okay, great. And seeing there's only one other person here, um, Saheda. Saheda? Yes. So I'll bring every. Oh. Let's see. Two, three, four. We had a fifth seat there. Where's my fifth seat? Got it taken away? What happened? All right. All right. Catherine? Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Skopik. I'm board and steering committee of the Interfaith Moral Action on Climate and chair and vice chair of two other environmental groups. We have sacred and secular imperatives to address the climate situation that we find ourselves in. So I congratulate the New York City Council for responding to the urgency of the climate situation by this legislation to create a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change I'm going to, we, I and we support all three of these bills. And I'm first going to talk about 1399 and then 1055 and 272 together. Uh, so first of all, a few comments on 1399. And I'm sure once you get up and rolling, once this department is going, some of the things that I am suggesting now, you will probably come to yourself. But I do just want to make sure uh, that these are included. First of all, on page two, I would very much like to see you including in that list permanent preservation of community gardens. They have been struggling for a long time in our city. They deserve a permanent place in this plan. And also please include green spaces and green roofs where structurally feasible. On page three, the listing of sustainability indicators, I would like to see coordination with transportation and renewable energy from offshore wind included in those indicators. These may not be the correct places for these, but going through it, it seems that this is where these things should go. Uh, and then on 33-104, uh, page four, I'd like two phrases added. Again, this is page 33, hyphen 104, page four. Add phrases. I'm gonna read what it says there, and then I'm gonna insert two phrases. The city will seek to implement or undertake to achieve each interim goal by no later than April 22, 2030. And I would like to insert in there and encourage achievement by the date of 2025. The long-term goals that the city will seek to implement undertake to achieve each goal by no later than April 22, 2050. And I would like to insert and encourage achievement by 2040. So the first one, the interim goals, encourage the five minutes earlier, or five uh, years earlier. And the second one on the long-term goals, I'd like to encourage 10 years earlier, because I think we all know that the urgency calls for that. Then 33107, page six, uh, include innovative technologies. I'd like you to please examine, and I think it's been mentioned already here, passive house for all new building high-rise construction. We have our first high-rise passive house on Roosevelt Island, and it's been very successful. So that can be included in this bill, all new construction be passive house, which is just about net zero. So we would be nipping in the bud a lot of the uh, carbon and gas emissions right there. And I'd also like you to consider installing 
uh, vertical axis wind turbines, this is just one example, this is a table model. And these can be put on buildings, they can be combined with other things. Okay, so now before my time runs out here, INT 1055 methane leaking mapping and INTO uh, 272. As these bills relate, relate to methane, methane emissions and methane leaks, I would like to emphasize our need to eliminate methane usage altogether and not add any more methane infrastructure. When work is being done taking up streets for construction, repair of water, electric, power or gas lines, we can use these opportunities to install geothermal and or heat pumps to supply neighboring buildings with these sources of renewable energy, as well as use these opportunities to install solar panels and or vertical axis wind turbines to power street lights and electric vehicle charging stations. So these are small steps, but we're at the point where every little bit counts. We need the offshore wind for the big picture, we need that big time, and such things as the vertical axis turbines on our street lights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Next up. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. If my voice sounds hoarse, it's because yesterday I was in Albany uh, <laughs> with many people who are pushing uh, the um, legislator up there, particularly Governor Cuomo, to pass the CCPA. Screaming and yelling, I lost my voice, and hopefully we um, made an impression upon him. That's a very good reason. We, we're, we're okay with that. <laughs> so we need to do what we need to do. All politics is local, and we need to take care of business here. I want to thank you all for um, all of your um, initiatives that, uh, uh, that the uh, council has put forward, and you in particular, uh, Speaker Constantinides, for all that you have done. So in regard to the first initiative, number 1055, I believe this amendment is necessary. Oh, I meant to say I'm Jackie Weisberg from 350 Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I believe this amendment is necessary in order to locate and recognize where all methane leaks occur or are likely to occur. Half of gas distribution pipelines under New York City streets are 50 years old or more. 25% of them are made of cast iron or other corrosion or leak prone materials. As was said earlier, a 2014 study conservatively estimated that 1,000 tons of methane leaks per year occur from the natural gas distribution system on Staten Island alone. And I left the uh, link that you can see to get to that study. Regarding the second initiative, number 272, Senate uh, Councilman, you're not here, but yes, it's a great bill. Cleaning one's own house and setting an example for all buildings in the city would be an important part of leading our state in the right in the fight against climate change. I believe buildings should be surveyed more than the initiatives call for at least once every five years to perhaps annually where reports to relevant agencies and departments indicate that these leaks have not been repaired, the city must step in immediately to make the repairs. Perhaps a Department of Greenhouse Gas Leaks Repair that deals solely with methane and any other greenhouse gas leaks can be created so that these leaks can be dealt with within a reasonable time after they're detected, detected and at the same time create new jobs. The third initiative, number 1399, the council has shown it has the will to address the climate crisis by putting forth such in initiatives as um, we are the ones that we are addressing today, as well as enacting laws such as the so-called dirty buildings bill. Now the city has to budget for all of this, including clean energy, the retrofit, the retrofit accelerator program, new technologies, training, expertise, and so on. There must be a centralized agency to coordinate efforts and prioritize sustainability and the mitigation of climate change rather than any individual agency's short-term budgetary priorities or constraints. These are things that you spoke with earlier from the mayor's office. 
this new department must have all the tools and authority needed to oversee this massive overhaul with complete oversight over all agencies. Having a commission and advisory board should ensure that the department is inclusive and represents all communities. In short, a clear plan is needed to put all the pieces in place. Utilities have shown us that they cannot be trusted to oversee themselves. We need a renewable energy grid for New York City, owned and operated by the city and state. Now, wouldn't that be nice? Environmental justice, new jobs, citizen involvement, budgeting, abandoning all fossil fuels, and ensuring that no pipelines come into our city are all essential to making the kind of impact that our city can and must do now. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, you, have to be, you have to be on the record. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Gregory Schwedock, and I'm sorry I don't have a uh, transcript for you, but I figure it'd be easier to, to look at each other. Um, I am a lifelong New Yorker, and I uh, want to thank you for the public education you gave me uh, that I'm a, I'm a product of. I also want to thank you for passing the Climate Mobilization Act. Um, and you've shown leadership, uh, all of you, and uh, Councilman Member Constantinides, uh, in all the individual actions that it takes, and they are all individually important. Having a binding bill uh, such as the, the buildings uh, legislation and, and really treating and mitigating the causes of the climate crisis uh, is indeed unprecedented in its uh, binding nature. However, uh, it is still not enough. As you can see, my shirt says uh, the climate mobilization. Um, and as a side note, I also part of um, uh, DSA and, and want to reiterate the, the points uh, the Amber, uh, Gustavo, and Ashley mentioned. They're all, all very strong. And, and pretty much all the points that people have made today. Um, so, and I'm also a member of say there. So, but my shirt says the, the words of the climate mobilization on it. And it is not because of the act that just passed, uh, but the organization I'm representing today, and specifically it's New York City chapter. Uh, Council member Constantinides, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, un the unimaginable world that uh, your children or, and our children will inherit when they are our age. By 2050, your children and my generation will inherit a horrific world. What is missing from this legis legislation is an emergency context. The public needs to understand, and with your continued leadership, the council needs to state that we are in a state of emergency. I won't belabor this point as there's a hearing on this on the 24th, and thank you for that. And I hope everyone here makes it back, at least and those who are here at the beginning of this uh, hearing. We went into World War II with horses, thinking that was a good idea, because we had no military capacity at the time. And we realized we needed a mobilization. FDR didn't make a 30-year plan to, to make 80% of the munitions that we needed by the Vietnam War. No. We did, had the largest mobilization this country has ever seen, and we did it in a matter of years. We went from no military capacity to making all the tanks, planes, bombs, parachutes, et cetera, to win the war. We tripled the number of women in the workforce. 40% of vegetables came from Victory Gardens. 10% of people moved over state lines for war jobs. Every man, woman, and child at home was collecting tin uh, or rubber for the war effort. <clears throat> so that, that is the example of the mobilization we need today and the level we need to do it at. We stopped, we had sacrifices. We stopped making luxury items. We didn't make cars and vacuum cleaners. We made all the goods we actually needed. So with your continued leadership, uh, today, Constantinides, you mentioned um, the 11 years we have that the IPCC uh, says we have to get to zero emissions. 
In fact, we don't even have that, but it's important that, we ha that we're recognizing that is the real time, uh, or closer to the real time scale. Really, we have 30 years, and it should have done it 30 years ago to, if we really wanted to be safe. But I know we're not changing timelines today on this legislation, um, but I'd hope that uh, specifically that uh, the Nancy Romer's words uh, that she couldn't testify today, but her uh, are, um, are looked at uh, for her plans, which said how this can be strengthened. And this is really, this department could really be empowered much more than a, seemingly it seems to give reports and plans for others to implement. And that's not gonna be enough. I, we really need to be empowered, the department needs to be empowered to make real change to, to get to any, you know, closer we need. So her points were, in very short paraphrasing, that it needs to be well-funded, needs to engage, second, it needs to engage communities not corporate and not be corporate heavy. Three, it needs to have a clear plan for oversight and enforcement. And on that, I'd say that we focus, even if the timetables don't change, that we focus on the, what can be implemented could, in the short term. If you could wrap up, that would be great. Oh, okay, great. Thank um, you. And the, yeah, basically the, Public, the development publicly, prioritized development publicly owned, as other members said. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Kate Lamort, Development Director at Gowanus Canal Conservancy. I'm here to voice our support for Intro 1399. Gowanus Canal Conservancy believes it is critical to develop and coordinate the implementation of policies, programs, and actions to meet the long-term needs of the city with respect to its infrastructure, environment, climate, and overall sustainability citywide. GCC is dedicated to facilitating the development of a resilient, vibrant, open space network centered on the Gowanus Canal through activating and empowering community stewardship of the Gowanus watershed. Since 2006, we have served as the environmental steward for the neighborhood through leading volunteer projects, educating students on environmental issues, and working with agencies, elected officials, and the community to advocate for, build, and maintain innovative green infrastructure. Over the past three years, we have been developing the Gowanus Lowlands Master Plan, which builds on the confluence of the Superfund cleanup, related cleanups at the city level, and the Gowanus rezoning. Through close collaboration with community landowners, elected officials, and agency representatives, the Gowanus Lowlands envisions a clean and thriving waterway of aquatic habitat, community activity, and bustling industry. In Gowanus, we see firsthand the effects of climate change on our city. We see close coastal flooding, rising groundwater, heat island impacts, as well as increased precipitation causing more sewage overflow into the canal. We fully support the formation of a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change to govern other agencies and create a holistic approach to combat climate change in order to achieve coordinated efforts to promote environmental sustainability and adapt to our changing climate. At the same time, a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change cannot reduce responsibility from other agencies, including the Department of Environmental Protection, buildings, city planning, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation, Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the Department of Parks and Recreation, the Department of Sanitation, the Department of Transportation, the Water Board, and NYC Municipal Water Finance Authority. A Department of Sustainability and Climate Change must be given the authority and the funding to govern at the work of other agencies and coordinate policies and programs of other agencies in order to turn our city into an example for the rest of the country and the world. We often experience the limitations of existing city agency silos and disinclination to innovate locally and address site-specific climate issues. We in Gowana struggle to get innovative street street tree design, rain gardens, and wet soils installed that are designed to Gowanus-specific specifications and account for neighborhood flooding, our high water table, and industrial landscape. Our Gowanus urban forest is sparse and young, leaving residents vulnerable to rising temperatures and inundating UV rays. The Gowanus Canal is continually polluted with sewage from our, co from our combined sewer system and increased rainfall rainfall and rising groundwater, coupled with growing population, will exacerbate this issue. Due to our unique location at the bottom of a topographical bowl, 
vertical protection, including rising, raising the shoreline and installing a tide gate at the mouth of the canal will worsen inland flooding and make the canal even more stagnant and, tos and toxic. A Department of Sustainability and Climate Change must be able to plan comprehensively and think beyond formulaic solutions in order to look carefully at site-specific impacts and solutions throughout the five boroughs. Time and time again, we see environmental injustices in our neighborhood, affecting the most vulnerable populations. Through capital investment in resilient infrastructure is critical, there, is, there must also be investment in social resilience. A Department of Sustainability and Climate Change must have a focus on equity and invest in emergency preparedness, racial equity analysis, and workforce training as essential elements of adapting our city to the changes ahead. GCC fully supports the formation of a Department of Sustainability and Climate Change it is important to the future of Gowanus and of New York City. Thank you for supporting the future of our city. Thank you, and, and I want to bring forward our two students here from uh, Global Kids. Go ahead. Good to see you again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Saida Majalabe. Um, I'm a 15-year-old high school student, a Global Kids Youth Ambassador, and someone who cares about the environment. <laughs> make sure you speak into the microphone and make sure you, I hear you on the record. Okay, that's perfect. Um, I'm just gonna raise my hand. <laughs> I have spent quite some time fighting for the <clears throat> for the climate change and how we need to act on the signs that's been clearly given. <clears throat> I have rarely talked to legislators to get on board with um, <clears throat> legislation that has recently passed, and I have educated people on the climate recently and what's going on and how they should be aware of what's going on around them. We need to act on the attacks of nature and the future for our planet. The planet has been crying and given us signs that it needs help and we need to help it. It's time for action and we need to fight against climate change. We need a department that will oversee all the legislation that has recently been passed. <coughs> we need a well-informed, experienced, educated people working together to get behind this Department of Sustainability and Climate Change. We need to make plans for the future that will promote positive change. My generation is begging for action and solutions to be able to live on this planet for, for more years to come. We need to act now. We need to be accountable by taking serious action as much damage is being done to the planet and will continue on if we do not. Thank you. Thank you. All right, dear everyone, thank you for having us today. Um, my name is Christian Pancorbo, and I'm an educator uh, with Global Kids, and I'm also a college professor for global, global development. Um, I'm here today in support of intro uh, number 272, 1055, and 1399. But more than that, I'm here today in support of Sahira and the next um, oncoming generation. Um, Global Kids works on climate justice, giving young people a uh, space and support to exercise their young, um, their own young activism. Um, today we have some laws that tackle climate change and I'm, I'm faced uh, with a reality that we all must understand now. The reality is that the effects of climate change will transcend every border and affect every aspect of life. And when something is that big, the solution and is to scale up to the problem and face it from every angle and every community. New York has always had the spotlight of the world and now again it has a chance to lead the way with initi initiatives such as the ones presented here today. We should make sure that we allocate the necessary resources with talent, 
money, political support, and anything else that is required. We should also acknowledge that any timelines must be adjusted for survival and also uh, for the sense of emergency that this issue requires. Um, I hope that this Department of Sustainability and Climate Change has a focus on also climate, ju climate justice, which is something that we um, care um, a lot at Global Kids. Um, um, I hope that we can speed up our actions, um, organize, fight, um, do all this as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Zahid, how old are you again? 15. 15. You've been doing an awful lot for 15. I'm really impressed. I am really very impressed. Thank you. So I, I look, f we keep running into each other. Yes. <laughs> so I, I keep, I look forward to our next encounter. I know you're going to be doing amazing things as always. So thank you for being here today. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. So with that, I want to thank everyone who testified today on all these legislations. I want to thank our, uh, our committee council, uh, the great Samara Swanston. I want to thank, uh, yeah, you can give her a round of applause. I'm okay with that. Uh, you can uh, give as well a round of applause to our policy analysts, both Nadia Johnson and Nikki Chawa, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, and then my staff, my counsel, Nicholas, Nicholas Wazowski, and my communications director, Terrence Cullen. Uh, I look forward to being back here with you on June 24th for our next hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee, but this time we'll gavel this particular hearing closed. Thank you.